My name's Katie, I'm 19 years old, and I recently joined a ranger team in Sutton Park, England. It's a peaceful and family-friendly park. The pathways are short and sometimes overgrown with lush plant life. The larger ones are big concrete, which during the right time of day have many people there. When I was enlisted, I spent the entire day following the track to our cabin, which contained four jeeps outside all four seaters with the flag of the Union Jack outside. The door had a small amount of mold on alongside the rest of the cabin. Despite the mold, it was habitable enough for me. I opened the door as it left an ear bleeding creak. When I stepped inside, there were two rangers sitting down on the table, both sharing a bottle of Jack Daniels. When I walk over, I ask if this is the right cabin in the recruitment papers, and they reply with, we're the only cabin, so yes. I then question if there's anyone else, as I saw there were more beds on the other side of the room than just two. They reply with, yeah, John, Will, Casey, Ruth, and Josh. I walk over to a vacant bunk and lay my duffel bag next to it. I searched around the cabin to find the female lockers. I'd take out my enlistment paper and enter the code to the locker. Inside, there was a full ranger's uniform and hygiene essentials. I'd return to the main room with my uniform on noticing that my uniform was a lot more clean and not as scruffy as the other two on the table. I'd walk around inspecting the cabin as I'd ask simple questions like their names. They'd both answer with Ellis and Harry. I'd eventually got bored and lay on my bed, taking out a few spare books I had. I'd read through them until it was about seventeen. Later that evening, Casey, Will, Ruth, and Josh return with scruffy and muddy clothes. Harry shouts, you're finally back. Ellis then asks, where's John then? Casey replied with he took another path on the trail. The others would then spot me in the corner on my bed, reading my book. We'd have a small conversation before Casey invited everyone to the main table for our food. Later that night, we'd all be anxious and suspicious on where John was, as it was now around 21, 50. We'd all eventually fall asleep around 22, 30, or at least I did. I wake up to a faint tapping at the window and light scratching. I dismissed it and assumed it was a bush or something, but then I realized that when I was inspecting, we don't have any bushes or trees around the cabin, or at least the only ones are at least 20 feet away. I'd sit up properly trying to make out a figure at the window until a loud slam against the window struck, a hand pressed against the window leaving a blood mark. I screamed and jumped up to look outside properly, only to see someone in a dirty and blood ranger's uniform with scratches all over it. I looked to their face to see their eyes removed, hair scruffy, and their nose bleeding. My scream lead all the other to jump out their bunks and run to me. They all questioned what. I turn around saying, look, as I'd continue to scream. When they looked outside, it was empty. I couldn't sleep that night and laid in the living area on the sofa with a cup of coffee to keep me awake. We all dismissed the situation as I just assumed it was a dream with me, sleepwalking or possible sleep paralysis. Nothing really happened again until the morning. We receive a call of an injured animal at about 12.30 p.m. to which we all rushed to. We'd find a small deer almost bled to death with scratch marks all over it. When we inspect the marks, they resemble a human's, but the cut was deep into the animal, either meaning this person had extremely long nails or something abnormal. We managed to save the deer, but we had to call a vet to take it away just in case. We then dismissed the situation as it was kind of normal for animals to be injured, but this was a full-grown deer. The only predators that we know of are foxes, and they would never cause this kind of damage. Ever since that night, I've questioned whether it was real or not. But the deer's wound just prolongs to my theory of that man outside my window. I'll never forget it. Never. I still work at my ranger job, as it pays good, and is relaxing to work around nature. John was reported missing, and we never saw him again until around a year later. From that situation, as a police report came through about a ranger's body, identified in a large, overgrown area. 
We quickly reported to the police that had to have been John missing from earlier. When they asked us to inspect his remains, we faintly agreed just to inspect who the body was when we looked at it. The other rangers agreed it was him, and then when I saw his face, I remember from that night, his eyes still gouged out scratches all over in blood covering him. I knew it was real, but what I didn't know was what happened, and nobody did. No evidence of weapons that could cause his wounds, but instead human scratch marks deep into his skin, just like the deer we found. I'll never forget any of this. I considered quitting my job, but like I said, good pay and nice working with nature. Me and William actually began a relationship with me, which we soon fell in love and still are. In 2004, me and a friend got into his truck one evening after work. Less than a minute later, a bright white light appeared in the sky approximately a half mile away. My friend started the engine, but we sat still and watched the light just hanging there in the sky. Although I didn't speak of it in the moment, I had the peculiar feeling that we were being observed just as intently. After two minutes or so, my friend began feeling unnerved by its presence when suddenly... The white ball of luminescence shot away horizontally at an impossible speed towards the town of Campton, Kentucky. My friend wanted to go home, and I needed to retrieve my car from his driveway. He put the truck in gear, and we promptly drove away and didn't notice anything until we had passed through the town of Campton, Kentucky traveling north on Capti 15. After passing through the town, we saw the same white light had appeared above our vehicle approximately 100 feet above us, and it was pacing along with our vehicle. My friend, whom I had known all through high school, became terrified and refused to acknowledge its presence. I found it wild and awesome. I was talking like I was addressing the light. I know who you are. Land that ship and I'll drive it like I stole it. I, for some reason, expected them to be able to sense on some level my thoughts and I wanted to make it very clear that I wasn't happy that they were there. It followed above us from Campton to Pine Ridge, then veered off to the left, disappearing behind the hill and trees. Then when we came to our left turn onto KI-715 towards Beattyville, it was hovering above the road, waiting for us to catch up. I had the distinct thought or impression at where we were going. Again, I replied verbally, but also projected my thoughts to it. In total, it followed above and slightly in front of our pickup for seven or eight miles. At Rogers, Kentucky, my friend began to make his turn down the road he lived on, and that's when the large, bright, white object shot off in the direction of Beattyville, Kentucky yet again, an impossible speed. I believe that I had an encounter with extraterrestrials when I was very young, and the impression that I received from them at that time was not good. I have felt since then that these are malevolent entities who want to exploit us was ever possible. That's just the way I feel. I grew up and have lived most of my life in Islip, New York. The date was September 22, 2023, at around 2.30 a.m. I was lying down with my boyfriend went to sleep at 2 a.m., and woke up and could see the time was 2, 30 a.m., but I was paralyzed and couldn't move. I tried to scream his name for help because I saw four gray aliens standing near me, but could not make a sound. This was not my first encounter with these beings. They were a little different than the average grays that I have experienced in the past. Their eyes were emanating dim light, as if they were some kind of contact lenses to see at night. They were looking at each other, communicating without words. One looked at me, then they all turned, and quickly the one closest to me stabbed my womanhood, for lack of better words. And it felt like the needle wand, looking thing went deep into me. The pain was like an excruciating burn, and I screamed in my head until I went unconscious. I woke up at 4 a.m. So did my boyfriend, 
He told me he was paralyzed and tried to talk to me, but found he could not. Two months followed with random 30-minute episodes of lingering pain from there to my spine. I believe that they've been touching me since childhood. I used to wake up with strange marks on my back. The last time previous to this incident was almost a decade ago. I'm scared that they have found me again. I was in southern New Mexico at the time. The date was August 14, 2008 at exactly 12.3 a.m. I saw a white creature that looked like a bald baboon. It had large almond-shaped eyes, and it was squatting at the edge of Interstate 10. I slowed the vehicle to see just what I was looking at. The creature stood up on two legs and turned and looked. I saw it had spikes running down its back. They almost looked like the hair of baboons, but thicker and more elongated. I could see its hands, and they were primate-like. The face had the look of a baboon as well. I didn't have time to stop because I had to make a delivery at home. When we made it to San Diego, California, I met up with the other drivers at the port, and we flew home. Four days later, we had a return trip on another delivery, this time in this same area. I witnessed the men in black, a lot of them with their black vans covered with antennas and some devices. I would not know how to describe it. The vans were unmarked and looking for something in that area. I counted 24 vans and one on the edge of the road. I saw some black OP choppers flying around in circles in the area. They were definitely looking for something on the ground. Might be the creature I saw. I'm a retired United States Army captain. I served for 12 years, including my last six years under the 7th Infantry Division, Fort Lewis, McCord, Washington. I'm going to make this short butt to the point. On many night trainings, we'd load up for night OPS in the woods on the southeast part of the Fort Lewis base. During the training, we would encounter these creatures, Bigfoot quite often. We know they're there. We're told not to engage them in any way. I know back a few years ago, a couple of enlisted troops got scared and emptied a few clips into a large male creature. Yes, they killed it. Within two hours, we had feds crawling all over the place. They left after talking with the two guys who killed the creature. They left in a large vehicle that was loaded down. Yes, these creatures exist. Bigfoot, Sasquatch, Grassman, etc., after speaking with a few fellow Army officers I've met, they too have encountered some of these creatures on other bases. When I was younger, I was heading to a friend's house right down the road in the middle of the night. It was all back roads and rural area. I made a sharp turn onto his road, and there was someone in the middle of the road holding a knife. I sat there in fear for a second. Then I thought about how dumb I was being and drove around the person. Still one of the scariest moments of my life. I was at a music festival, Pagan Metal, yes it's important, and went back to the remote camping alone. I was high, and the camping was kind of far away. I thought, hey, just hike your way back, so I took the long way around. Needless to say, I got lost. I got mildly panicked, but not that much, so I kept going. I saw a light coming from a fire between the trees. Good, these people will help me, I thought, so I kept walking forward. I found myself in a small field with one huge and two smaller bonfires, people in robes chanting in an unknown language and screaming and dancing. Bloody animal skins were dripping with blood, and a rotten sheep corpse was oozing with unknown liquids. I screamed out of fear, and they all stopped and looked at me. I knew I was trespassing on something ancient, and I wouldn't be able to just walk away. And then I stopped being a moron and actually looked at the scene. 
It was the aid, the end of Ramadan. They were wearing the jellabays, roasting some juicy sheep. Yeah, it was bloody around where they killed it, but that's kind of normal. They were chanting and having a good family and friend party. They even had some booze for the family members who were not active Muslims. They invited me in and laughed a lot when I explained why I looked so scared at first. I stayed all night with them, having a really good time. Edit. Another time, a guy jacked off behind a bush on me and my girlfriend bathing in a waterfall. Actually creepy, but less entertaining. I, Detective Mayheffy from Alamo, Van Buren County, Michigan, along with J. Rood, have been in Cincinnati for a couple of days searching for a young man named Dwight T. Holmes, whom we believe to be here. It's a matter of life and death, and finding Holmes is of utmost importance. The account shared by Mr. Rood is quite extraordinary, and his own daughter is a key figure in the story. On the evening of John, Nine, his daughter Kitty attended a candy pull in Alamo with Holmes. The couple, along with Miss Annette Garlanger, waited at her home for her folks to return. With Holmes's curiosity about his mesmeric powers, he first put Miss Garlinger under hypnotic influence, making her smoke a cigar and perform other actions at his command. He then experimented on Miss Kitty Rude a person of a very nervous disposition prone to hysterical attacks. Holmes found her to be an easy subject, compelling her to engage in a series of absurd acts, concluding with the order to feign death. Immediately she assumed a corpse-like state, and her respiration ceased. Holmes, alarmed, sought the village doctor, who, after examination, attributed the young lady's condition to heart disease, the grieving parents accepted this, and a funeral took place on Friday, Jan. 13. Holmes disappeared on Thursday night. As a coffin descended into the grave, Miss Garlinger became hysterical. She was taken home, and gradually the story of the case unfolded. A rush to the cemetery ensued, with a group of men digging at the newly made grave. The body was brought home, and Dr. Vanderberg, the leading physician at Pawpaw, the county seat, conducted a critical examination, determining that she was not dead, but in a trance. Hypnotists from various places were called, yet they proved ineffective. The parents believe that only Holmes can help their daughter, as he alone, having induced her hypnotic condition, can release her. Miss Rood remains at her home appearing lifeless, while Holmes is suspected of hiding to avoid arrest for manslaughter. Despite this, he is described as a very good-looking young man with an excellent reputation. Was driving in a nearby tourist town, and it was dark. Myself, partner, and kids were in the car. All of a sudden, out of nowhere, a girl in a white dress walked out in front of my car. I screamed, slammed on the brakes, but she just disappeared, vanished. Nowhere to be seen. It was insane. The town is called Portlington in Victoria, Australia. I would love to research the history one day to try make sense of what happened that night. My mom wasn't a trucker, but was in Michigan on a road trip with some friends. She drew first shift for driving, and they left around 5 a.m., so she was pretty tired. Anyway, they're driving in silence for a good while. Then my mom sees an animal standing on the side of the road and bursts out. Holy cow, a kangaroo in the middle of upper Michigan. They didn't let her drive much longer after that. I was driving home from doing some shopping in a nearby town and was all alone just driving and listening to the radio. It was just before sunset on a beautiful summer day. I was admiring the sky because it was such a bright orange. 
while driving through some S-curves in the road, I made the first turn and saw some deer dart across the road. Immediately, I hit the brakes to slow down, not knowing if there were more to come out of the woods. On the opposite side of the road, it drops down a steep embankment to a farm field. I had slowed the car down and scanned the tree line for more deer. That's when this thing jumped out of the woods, running after the deer. He landed in the middle of the road and cleared the rest of the road in his next stride. It's so hard to comprehend what I saw, but it sounds like the descriptions that people have claimed on here. It was a gray figure with a short, sleek coat. I did not see a tail on this creature. It was on all fours and was the same height as the deer. His head was very odd. It looked like a dog head with cropped pointed ears, but had a very short muzzle. He briefly turned his head towards me when he crossed in his eyes. I wouldn't say they glowed, but they weren't normal animal eyes. They were like dull yellow. And they definitely stood out. His body was what really confused me, because the way it moved was like a human would move when trying to run on all fours. Its gait looked lazy, like he was just kind of loping across the road. It was very muscular on the front end, but had a very thin, almost sickly-looking abdominal area and hind legs. Once he was across the road, I lost sight of him over the embankment. I was so confused as to what I saw that I didn't tell anyone right away for fear that they would think I was crazy. I have been searching for answers since then, but came up with nothing. I eventually told my husband and one close friend, but neither of them had heard of anything that matched my description. I'm still not 100% sure that I saw a dogman, but it is the only thing I have come across that sounds reasonably close to what I saw. My wife and I were taking a late-night stroll through a wooded area near our home in Omaha, Nebraska. This was back in the late fall of 2018. We know the area well and have frequented the grove many times. As we approached the wooded area, we could see lights from the houses beyond the grove shining through the trees. As we approached, we noticed there appeared to be shadows darting through the trees. We immediately thought there were children playing around down there. We decided to go and check it out and possibly to scare the kids for fun. We got close to the trees and realized there were no children in the grove of trees. No one could be seen at all. We took a side entrance into the grove and walked into the trees, wondering if the shadows we saw simply came from the light from the houses in the distance, like maybe our eyes were playing tricks on us. The grove was well lighted, as there was a lot of moonlight and virtually no leaves left on the trees. It was fairly cold. It happened before the first snowfall and dead leaves littered the ground. As we walked holding hands into the grove, we abruptly heard a footfall in the leaves. At that time, the unknown entity crossed our path. It moved in glimpses as if under a strobe light. Only no light was given off. As it crossed our path, it was visible one moment and then gone the next. This alternated as it strode in front of us. It smiled at us and appeared to be waving. I wasn't prepared for this, and seeing it froze me in fear. The entity was a biped that stood taller than me at five foot ten. It was completely naked, though no genitalia could be seen. Where human genitals should have been there appeared to be nothing there, as you would imagine a doll would look. Its skin was a dark grayish color. It had very small black eyes which reflected the moonlight. Its ears were tight against its head. The ears came to a point. The jaw was bigger than any human's. The jawline went all the way up the sides of its head as if its smile stared behind its ears. Rows of sharp white teeth were visible as it smiled at us. It had slits for a nose that were slightly flared at the top. I can't remember how many fingers it had, but it definitely had digits that it held up as it waved. The encounter lasted all but a few minutes. The instant I was able, I twisted my wife's arm and I grabbed hold of her wrist. I'm twice my wife's size with a very athletic build. I ran at top speed, literally dragging her in the dirt through the leaves out of the grove up the grass hill through the soccer field and into the street. 
As we reached the street, I noticed my wife was yelling and screaming at me to stop and go back. Go back, she said, as she badly wanted to make contact with the entity. But my fear overpowered me, and I dragged us both into the house. From our doorstep, we could see the grove of trees. I immediately said, don't say anything, as I didn't want our testimonials to become tainted with any kind of suggestion from one another. I separated us into different rooms and had us write down our testimonials of what we saw. To no surprise, we both described the same entity with the same features. This event has affected my life very negatively, as my family thinks my wife and I made it up or are just plain lying to get attention or something, not knowing what this entity was keeping me up many nights. I must have thought about every possibility. I thought, could it have been a spirit? A human in Hollywood-style movie makeup? Maybe a Scooby-Doo type hologram projector or even an alien? To this day, not knowing eats at the back of my mind. I fully know aliens exist. With the vastness of space and the countless stars in the universe, it becomes clear that we cannot possibly be the only life. Even now, I can feel my heart racing as I recall the event. Did I miss out on a one-in-a-billion chance to possibly communicate with another intelligent life form? I only have one regret in my life, and that regret is not going back to find out for sure what it was, if we are ever going to communicate with beings like this. If indeed it was one, we need to have love at the center of our awareness, so we don't flee in fear for no reason. For a long time, I never told anyone but my closest friends and my immediate family for fear that people would think we were crazy. But it's come to a point that this itch in the back of my brain has gotten so bad I feel it necessary to tell others of what we saw. I've become so obsessed with searching the web for possible information on the existence of alien life that I often spend hours of my time sifting through garbage on the Internet just trying to find someone, somewhere, who has seen an entity like the one we saw. I am not crazy. I am a former state certified law enforcement officer and academy trained in Tennessee and Ms. Without question, this creature is the real thing. I ceased driving at night and ceased going out into the woods. I live on 43,000 acre Pickwick Lake surrounded by forested national and state wildlife refugees in three states, MS, AL, and TN, sir, I have no reason to lie or fabricate a story. In all these sightings, on two of them, I had eyewitnesses in the vehicle with me. The Mrs. Highway 25 sighting by the railroad overpass bridge in Tishomingo County, Minnesota, was the same creature I saw on the levee on State Route 128 in December 2010. Apparently, these creatures travel in swampy or drainage ditch areas close to roadways or in forested areas with thick tree lines near pastures. In the summer of 1991, I was driving between Forest, Mississippi and Harper Valley on State Route 35 between 9 10 p.m. A wild-eyed creature, which the witness labeled as a like android, between the height of seven eight feet tall on four legs passed in front of my vehicle. I was driving a 1987 Honda Accord four-door and my height was six foot four, weighing 295. At the time of the sighting, I was an employee of the Mississippi Depth of Wildlife, Fisheries, and Parks Division of Parks and Recreation, stationed in at Golden Memorial State Park in Lake and Scott County on Highway 492 as assistant park manager. After my departure, I relocated to Hardin County, Tennessee to 195 Goodman Street, EXT Savannah, TN 38,372 from 39226, and after my divorce, relocated to 295 Windy Pines, laying in counts, TN 38,326, 26 to the present date.
I again saw this creature in 1995 on MS State Route 25 between Elk Landing and Goat is Land Road. The creature came out between the red brick house and railroad tracks and ran in front of my car into a kudzu bank in broad daylight. I saw it run across Highway 128 in Hardin County, TN between Sand Hill Holiness Church and Stag Lane. It crossed in front of my 1992 Cadillac Seville, moving at a fast pace. That was in the fall of 2006. I also saw it at the four-way stop sign on Pyburn Road at Bruton Branch Convenience Store in the winter of 2008. The last sighting was on Pickwick Dam Levee State Route 120, eight just above the four-way stop sign with State Route 57 at State Park Golf Course. This was December 2010. It was October 5, 2017, at 5 something in the morning, and I was driving myself to work. I like to take back roads because they're peaceful in the early hours of the morning. I was a few years fresh out of high school and never heard of Dogman. I remember it was a full moon, so the semi harvested cornfields were illuminated, and I could see all around me. Well, a field I was driving next to was a soybean field already harvested so I could see the tree line on the other side unhindered. I noticed something moving really fast in the moonlight, but it was far enough away that I thought maybe it was a deer running. It kept up with my truck. I must have spooked the deer, I thought. I came to a curve with two homesteads on it, where the tree line met the property line of the two I noticed at the corner of my eye. Something large, so I glanced at what looked like a pointy-eared mass of fur. But by the time I turned my head completely to look through the passenger side door, the giant woolly creature was right at my window, like we almost collided it had reared up. Its chest, which I could only see a glimpse of, was partially hairy and almost human-like. I sped up and didn't look back till I got further down the road. I wanted to make sure it wasn't following me low. The thing was tall and could run on all fours. But it was not shaped like an ape, and it was not a bear. I live in northern Illinois, and my work was next to a river in the forest preserve, so I'm sure that it was trying to travel to the river, as rivers have always been an easy means of travel for many species. Part of me still thinks the creature was just as surprised as I was. Maybe it thought it could beat me and cross the road before I got there. When I got to work, I was in shock still and tried to tell my co-workers what I had seen, and they didn't know what to say, probably thought I was crazy. After that, I began to research to make sure I really wasn't crazy, and sure enough, a ton of people have witnessed a tall dogman-like creature roaming about North America. Before I delve into my sighting, let me provide some background information. Crosswicks, or Chesterfield, New Jersey, is a known Revolutionary War battleground and may hold some supernatural or paranormal significance, as evidenced by a cannonball lodged in an old building there. A few days ago, around 9 p.m., I was making my way back home from my current job, and it was pitch dark outside. For those familiar with the Chesterfield area, it's predominantly rural, with miles of farmland stretching as far as the eye can see. At night, visibility is extremely limited. Driving down the long roadways, I noticed something sprinting from the wooded side of the road into the fields. It was remarkably large, resembling the largest coyote or wolf I've ever encountered about the size of a duke. It locked eyes with my car as it crossed the road. Its eyes were a vivid shade of yellow, and its coat had a dark brown hue. It moved on all fours and exuded an extremely intimidating presence. Baffled by the sight, I immediately alerted my family to the presence of this unusually large canid in the area. I have absolutely no idea what it could be, but it was unquestionably the largest coyote or wolf I've ever witnessed. Another noteworthy detail is that my family's house, not far from the sighting location and surrounded by woods, has been unusually quiet, 
these past few nights as I've been coming home. What did I see? Was it a hellhound, a dogman, or simply a large wolf? I have no answers, and I'm reaching out here in hopes of finding some insight. My grandfather told me the story about how he was driving west to east along an empty stretch of road in southern South Dakota. He stopped at a stop sign at an intersection with nothing in sight. No buildings and no other vehicles. Then there was a bright light that hit him. He looked up and saw a bunch of blinking lights. Next thing he knew, he was at the counter of a diner about an hour down the road. It was about six hours later, and he had no idea what had happened. He asked the person at the diner when he came in, and the guy told him he came in about ten minutes ago and just started drinking coffee without talking much. My grandpa told him what had happened, and the guy said something like, Yeah, that happens around here sometime. Nothing weird ever happened to him again. He avoided that area for the rest of his life. He said he doesn't believe in aliens and doesn't know what happened, but I had a suspicion he thought he had been abducted and just never accepted it. He told me never to tell this story to other people, but he died years ago, and most of the people who knew him are dead, so I figured it was okay. I really don't know what happened, and it's freaking me out. I really just need some help understanding what happened to me and my friends. I'm sorry in advance, but this is going to be a long one. I want to preface this by saying it's 3 a.m. while I'm writing this, and I'm sorry for any grammar mistakes. Okay, let me explain. Two days ago, I was with my friends. For safety reasons, let's call them Callie and Xander. And we were at my grandparents' house while they were out of town because I'm the caretaker of the house. When they are gone and my friend wanted to hang out for a little bit. After I finished all my chores, I decided I wanted to take them to my old hideout in the woods. I do remember telling them the woods were off limits and that if my uncle caught us, I'd be in trouble. Xander was a little hesitant, but ended up going with me and Callie. I just want to clarify they both agreed to go. I did not force them. Anyway, like a group of stupid teens in a horror movie, we all walked to the woods looking to just have some fun and mess around. We get to the opening in the woods and I tell them it's going to be a very big climb. Callie pulls out her phone and starts recording. Xander sounds a little scared and says he's not good with climbing. But Callie ends up convincing him to go anyway. After Xander agrees, Callie screams, bring it on, in a joking way. It's important for the rest of the story later, before entering the woods with Xander and I. We get about halfway to the hideout when Xander stops and says he has an eerie feeling. I tell him it's probably nothing, and we continue walking. A few minutes later, we were at my old hideout, and Callie started being all loud and obnoxious, and I reminded her to be quiet because of my uncle. At some point, Xander asks if we can leave because his back was starting to hurt, so we got up and started walking back. We got out of the woods and started to walk back to the house when Xander and Callie started to freak out, saying they really didn't have a good feeling. I told them I didn't feel anything, but right as I did, I got a very scary image in my head. It was this thing, it's about six foot five, black muscular figure with horns crawling on all four. I tell them this, and Callie ends up saying she needs to sit down because it felt like someone had punched her in the stomach, and then she collapses onto the ground. I look at Xander and ask him to help me get her up. She was still awake, but really out of it. We start walking with her, and we only get a few steps when she regains complete consciousness. She looks at us and says, uh, I'm scared. Right after she says that, we hear a little kid screaming bloody murder without thinking we all sprint back to the house. We get back to the house, and Xander and I are freaking out at this point, but Kelly is oddly calm. We ask her what's wrong, and she won't answer. Five minutes into trying to see if she's okay, she starts mumbling in a language that isn't English. And for as long as I've known Kelly, I know that the only language she knows is English. 
She keeps mumbling and then starts laughing, too. I tell Xander to get Callie to the car while I run inside the house to lock the doors. I get the house all locked down, and then I run to my car. Xander is holding Callie at this point, and I'm trying to find my key. I find it in my pocket, and I unlock the car for Xander to get Callie in the car. I hop in the car and crank it while Xander is getting her buckled in and everything. Xander get in the car, and I rush out of there heading to my dad's house to get my sage and stuff. Because at this point, Xander and I have a feeling she's not Callie anymore, if you know what I mean. I'm speeding through some back roads to get to my dad's house, because I realize the longer we're in the car, the worse Callie was getting. She was unresponsive and not reacting to anything we said to her. We get her to my dad's, and I run inside and get the sage. I told Xander to take her outside to the backyard so my neighbors wouldn't see us. Xander sits her down, and I light the sage, and I'm smudging the sage and saying something along the lines of this is her body. Not yours. You need to leave. I do not welcome you here anymore. You're not allowed to haunt her, my friends. The house or me. And about 20 minutes later, Callie comes back. We asked her what happened, and she said she didn't remember anything and that she felt trapped. Six or seven minutes later, my dad called me and told me he had just left work and that he was going to pick up food. I told him I had friends over, and he offered to get them food, too. At this point, we'd all calmed down. We tell him what we want. We eat and laugh like nothing happened. But it doesn't end there at all. Next day, yesterday... My friend Xander didn't come to school. I texted him asking if he was okay, and this is what he said to me. Yeah, I'm fine. Something happened last night, and it made me stay up until 3 a.m., so my mom let me stay home. And then hours later, he followed up with, I think, a spirit attached to me, like an evil one, and Callie texted me saying something felt very wrong at her house. She sent me a video, and it was her walking into her room and the blinds were moving. Steph was knocked off shelves, and she was just freaking out, because none of her family was house. She was alone hours after we got out of school that day, too. And to be honest, I don't like the feeling I get sleeping at my dad's. Not to mention, I have guinea pigs, and they've been acting weird since this happened, like they're more aggressive towards me and each other. I really don't know what to make of this, and I need help understanding this. Daddy, I want to clear a few things up for the people commenting. Thank you for doing so, but I want to make everything clear for y'all. Okay, we are a group of teenagers, 16, 18. Xander and I are not Christian. I'm pagan, and Xander is a non-believer completely. Callie is the only Christian in the group. I have a protection necklace, and Xander is just strong in a spiritual way. Callie was the only vulnerable one. I gorned their warnings because I didn't feel anything, and I normally can, but I'd forgotten I'm not as strong because I stopped my practices for a while, so of course I didn't feel anything until it was too late. One more thing, like I said, I do practices, so I did know what to do when we figured out what was wrong with Callie. I could tell the energy wasn't too strong, so I knew that just sage and a chant would do it. I was 16 years old, male, in Mexico, in a small town in the mountains called Jalpan, visiting family. One night, my cousin, 19 years old, male, and I went to the park in his dad's truck, a small Nissan extended cab that we borrowed with the condition to feed the animals at his dad's farm. Like kids, we didn't go to the farm first. We played basketball until around 10 -ish. Afterward, we rode down the mountain about two miles into a clearing where his dad had his farm. As we approached the pen, we heard all the animals crying, and when we looked, they were huddled into a corner of the pen, crying as if there was danger. My cousin told me to grab the twenty two LR rifle from the back seat of the truck. As I did and was in the process of turning around, the brightest light I had ever seen came on, making it look like daylight outside. I could see across the mountain as if it were day. I grew up in some of the poorest and bad neighborhoods around Miami, so I know a helicopter spotlight when I see and hear one. 
At this point, I was looking up through the windshield to see where it was coming from, but there was no direct point. It looked like it was just on, and there was no noise from a helicopter or any similar vehicle. It was super quiet, and even the animals had stopped crying. The truck turned off at this point, and we were in a bit of a panic because it wouldn't come on. Since it's a manual transmission and we were on an incline, we started putting it in gear and letting it roll to start it. After about the sixth or seventh try, it came on. He hit a U-turn, and we were going up onto the main road. Next thing you know, we were home. Neither of us can remember how we got home or what path we took to get home. There are only two ways to get there. One road takes you through the town, and the other takes you by the river and dam. We can't recall which one we took, and all we remember is making it to the main road off the farm's road. In this small town where the newspaper is printed every two days, he showed me an article two days later, or a day later, where a reporter was questioning local government officials, police, and military personnel about the lights that were hovering over the valley that night. The article ends with no one knowing or admitting to knowing anything about it. This happened two years ago. My, now deceased, boyfriend and I were walking to our primitive campsite for his birthday, and we arrived a bit before sunset. As we were walking, we realized the site was further than we thought, and he decided to run up ahead to see if he could find it before it got dark. While I was walking alone, after quite some time, I started to hear voices, and it sounded like he was talking to other campers. At this point, I saw what looked like big round string lights hanging, similar to those at a campground. I started walking towards them, thinking I would catch up to him and whoever he was talking to soon. It felt like I was walking forever, and then I heard or saw him running back towards me. By this time, it was getting dark, and he told me that he hadn't found it yet, and that the trail kept going. I asked if he ran into other people or saw the lights, and he looked at me weirdly, saying there was no one else there, and he didn't see any lights. To this day, if he hadn't come back when he did, I feel like I might have been spirited away or taken by whatever I was seeing. I will not be camping at that state park ever again. My friends and I saw some sort of dog-like demon thing in eastern Iowa. We were exploring this old house out in the country after dark, just looking around with maybe some mild vandalism. Well, we had checked out the upstairs and most of the downstairs when I saw a door that we hadn't been through yet. I grabbed the door handle and suddenly had a feeling of dread come over me. I slowly pushed the door open and noticed that the room was slightly lit up with a dim red light that had no discernible source. I got the door probably halfway open then heard an incredibly deep growl and saw the upper end of a dog thing, probably around the size of a German Shepherd. Its teeth protruded past its upper and lower lips, a rather significant amount, and its stance was super hostile. The thing that really scared me, though, was its eyes. They were glowing red. I noticed that there was blood and viscera all over everything, chunks of flesh and organs all over the floor, and streaks of blood on the walls. The smell was overpowering. I slammed the door and hightailed it out of there. Here's the part where I'm an idiot. I went back about noon the next day. I had a huge knife with me when I went back to the door and slowly grabbed the handle, but felt none of the dread from the night before. I pushed it open, and I kid you not, this perfectly square, windowless room was literally coated in blood and fur. I could see what looked like three separate, mutilated dog corpses. They weren't cut apart. They were shredded. I nearly threw up, shut the door, and left again. I'll never go back there again, especially after dark.
Okay, might not be as exciting or intriguing as most posts on here, but here goes. When I was younger, I lived in a terraced Victorian brick house on the side of a hill. One Saturday afternoon, my dad and I were watching TV when we heard this swishing or blowing noise approaching from outside. At first, it sounded like it might have been some electric vehicle, like a milk float. But it got more and more bassy, deeper as it got louder, and then we heard it, along with very slight vibrations passing beneath the house. We looked at each other, startled and confused, and at that point it ended fairly abruptly. I've racked my brains for this for years, but even now I'm completely stumped. We were on a narrow street with cars going past semi-regularly. It sounded nothing like a, any sort of vehicle I've ever heard. Plus, despite it first sounding like it was outside, it definitely ended up being something occurring beneath the house, and it sounded quite deep. I'm thinking tectonic activity of some kind, maybe. I'd love to figure out what caused this phenomenon and to even hear that sound again, but Googling turns up nothing. Anyway, like I said, not a majorly exciting happening, but something I finally wanted to post somewhere. This is only the second or third time I'm experiencing this. I have no idea what to think. This time one of my shoes has completely vanished. I live in a small dorm alone. I wear these slip-on shoes when I go outside to take out the trash, or if I won't be long. They get put back next to my bed every time I get back. Yesterday I went to get up and put them on, and only one was next to my bed. No big deal. Maybe I flung one under my bed. Nope. Nowhere to be found. There really isn't anywhere else to look because this is such a small dorm space. I looked everywhere anyway. Nowhere. I'm confused and I feel crazy. A few months ago, my Beats headphones also mysteriously vanished and I still have not found them after I use them every day. At this point, I have no idea what to think. But I want to mention that sometimes when I'm sleeping, I hear things fall or weird noises at night. It's a little creepy, but I thought it might be coming to the rooms next to me or above. I always lock my door when leaving. There is no way for people to take something. And of course, why a single shoe? This also reminds me that sometimes things will duplicate. I have a pink calculator. Just one. I hate math as it is so. Why would I want more than one? One day I go to do homework, grab my calculator out of my bag, go to open to my bedside drawer for a pencil. The same exact calculator. I have no idea where it came from. None of my friends have the same one. Really weird. Before we dive into this, we are not addicted to gambling, Lowell. I've been best friends with my buddy Q since third grade. We're both 23 now. We've had our rough patches, but everyone does, and I'd do anything for him the same way he would for me. Many unexplained events happen, but only when we're together. Neither of us has events like these happen when we're either with someone else or by ourselves. The first one happened literally like three weeks after I met the kid. I was staying at his house, and the power went out while we were writing down Kita IV cheat codes on a notepad. We were pissed, but we just went to bed and started talking. Then, as a joke, we were like, let's do a countdown, then the power will come back on, and on exactly one, the power came back on after being off for like five hours. We played tons of video games together during high school days, mainly Call of Duty, and we both dropped nukes, very good games, but only when playing together. Never once have either of us gotten a nuke without playing with the other. Now that we're older, we go to casinos and play sports bets together. Every time we go with a different group of people, we almost always lose or make only $100. But every time we go together, we make a ridiculous amount of money. The same thing happens with sports bets. 
Every parlay I take without him never hits or hits for a very small amount of cash. But when we both place the same bet, it hits. And it hits big. Literally last night on the Lakers game, we won a four five thousand six leg parlay. The biggest one, though, is two things that happened in one night. We were exploring an abandoned, insane asylum when we walked into a bathroom, and immediately both of us were like, something's off in here, we should leave right now. We booked it out of the entire building, almost like something was chasing us, literally terrified. Maybe three minutes after we left, the roof of the building caved in directly above the bathroom we walked into. Later that night, while we were talking about it, we were in his house with the back door wide open. It was summer with no AAC, and I was like, dude, a bear could walk in right. And before I could finish my sentence, he noticed a bear standing maybe five feet away from the open door. There are tons of other small or big things that have happened, and I know they're not the most convincing stories out there, but they're real. You just got to take my word for it. When we get together, it's like the rest of the world has to listen to us, and it's honestly beginning to creep me out. Let me know what you guys think it is, because neither of us is into that whole side of things, and we both notice it all the time. This happened a few days ago. I was laying in bed watching YouTube with a candle lit on my bedside table. I do this every night and blow out the candle when I want to go to sleep. I was just watching Markiplier when I suddenly had an extremely vivid vision of me falling asleep early and my cat knocking over my candle. I don't have a working fire alarm in my room and I hadn't slept the night before, so I didn't wake up right away. I saw my room engulfed in flames. My house is wooden. And I vividly saw and experienced me not being able to find my cat and not knowing if I should leave or look for her. To be honest, my cat is my whole world. I would be devastated without her. I immediately had a panic attack. My heart rate shot way up. I was hyperventilating and shaking. I felt the most terror in those moments than I ever have my entire life. I was so scared I didn't know what to do. I just sat frozen for a few moments before I reached over and blew out the candle. Immediately everything was fine again. In a second my heart rate went back to normal. All my fear was gone and my panic subsided completely. I've had many panic and anxiety attacks before and they always take me at least a few minutes to recover. This was unlike anything I've ever experienced. I not only saw with my eyes or my brain, my house burning down, but I felt the terror of not being able to find my cat and the choice I had to make. Has anyone else ever experienced anything like this? And do you think something or someone saved me in my house? I, 50 female, bought a house almost three years ago in northern Maryland. Property is over two acres with a spring creek running through it and a 120-year-old farmhouse up a hill. Rest of the original property had been divided years ago, and there are McMansions around our quiet haven. More than an acre is fenced and landscaped. The rest is a bit wild, with plenty of wildlife moving around. A few months after we moved in, my daughter, 30, came for the weekend. We had piled a bunch of lawn debris and deadwood at the bottom of the hill near the creek, but inside the fence, to have a bonfire for the grandkids. They had gone to bed after s'mores, and my soul stayed in the house with them. Daughter and I sat by the fire and chatted for a while. I felt like we were being watched, just a metal ping, but not menacing. I see across the creek, about 30 yards away, a perfect white circle that looked to be about 15 18, across. Then I realized it had a very thin, dark body, average height, behind the tree it was leaning against. I'm a calm person and asked my daughter if she could see it as well. She said yes, and we quietly got up and walked toward the house. Checked the next day and saw nothing unusual where it had been. Never saw it again, but also didn't go looking. 
Several weeks ago, daughter reported seeing it again on this side of the creek. Last week, she was FaceTiming a friend who also saw it just within the yard. No idea what it is, but not comfortable with it, getting closer to the house. In retrospect, not sure if the white circle is part of it or just a cover so we couldn't see the face. Any ideas? I had an experience last night. My sister and I were out on the back porch with the dogs when our sheep, which we keep in a yard right next to the dogs, started running around like they were being chased. I thought maybe our herding dog, who we keep in the barn about a half mile down the road, had gotten down here somehow and was bothering them, so I turned on my phone's flashlight. The sheep were huddled in a corner near the dogs at this point, and I didn't see anything, and after waiting a few minutes, the dog didn't start chasing them again, so I turned off my flashlight. A bit after I did, they started running again, so I turned my light back on and again, saw nothing. Turned it back off, and they ran back to their original corner. This continued for a bit until one time when my light was off, and I saw a curly black dog's tail silhouetted against our white truck. Aha, problem solved. That's exactly what our herding dog's tail looks like, so obviously it's her. At this point, I turned my light back on, didn't see her, and kept it on. I called her name, and she didn't come, which was a bit weird. She's a very obedient dog, even if she does get excited and over. Heard the sheep. I kept calling her name, and then eventually the sheep ran from the corner they were in and across the yard again. I hadn't seen the dog scare them, but whatever. They were near the edge of the yard where a relatively small border collie could easily hide in the shadows. The sheep kept running to and from different corners as if being spooked, and I kept just missing the dog getting to where she could scare them in the direction they ran. Actual weird stuff. Then it started getting a little weird. The sheep ran back to the corner near the dog yard, and this time I saw a black llama shape, again partially silhouetted by the car where I thought I saw the dog's tail earlier. We have a black baby llama in that yard, so I thought, oh, she's chasing the sheep. She's always been very friendly with the sheep and calm, unlike our grown llama who is not in that yard, but maybe she learned from the adult. But then, this is the unexplainable part. The sheep ran from that, again fully illuminated, corner they were in. I didn't see the llama do anything to scare them. In fact, I can't see her anymore. But okay. But then the sheep ran from their new corner as if the llama chased them from there too, when there is no way she could have gotten to that corner without me seeing her. A llama's are big. At this point I can clearly hear the lama's hoofbeats and have no idea how I ever thought it was a dog chasing them, but this is hilarious. Our sweet llama terrorizing the sheep in the middle of the night, so I pull out my camera and record. I can't see the llama on screen at all, but she's black, so I guess the phone just isn't picking her up even with the flash. The sheep keep running across this same stretch of grassy area, presumably chased by the llama. I can't see her chasing them, which is odd since she's so big, but that side of the yard's darker, so I'm probably just overlooking her. But then, the sheep ran again, and this time directly across a completely clear area and into a corner that's just dirt. That's great. Even if it was a squirrel chasing them, I'll be able to see it this time. But then, they run from that corner and I see absolutely no other animal. Definitely not the llama, not even a raccoon. Nothing could have gotten in that corner to scare them back out without me seeing it. Plus, now that I'm looking around the yard to see what I missed, I see the llamas in the very back. There's a small chute that leads to more of the yard, which the sheep never went into, and I would seen the llama leave. What the F? Then after the sheep stop in a new corner, I hear hoofbeats. These hoofbeats are loud, hella loud, and fast. They sound like a horse galloping. At this point, I freak out because there's no way a horse got in there, and I didn't see it. Both of our horses are red, unlike the dog and the llama. So... That's it. No way am I doing this. I go inside the house and bring the dogs with me. Don't go back out the rest of the night. 
I went down to the barn this morning, and the horses and the dog were all in there. No holes in the fences. No way they could have gotten out and back in. Now, these are very calm sheep. We specifically have them down here instead of at the barn because they won't get spooked by the dogs. They're the old sheep. They're not prone to getting spooked or running around for no reason. And in fact, are quite lazy. Again, old. The places they were running from made it clear that whatever was chasing them was in the yard, not outside of it. Sometimes they would run from the center of the yard. The yard they're in is small the size of a suburban home's backyard. My flashlight illuminated everywhere they ran, except for the very edges, which again weren't the only places they were running from. We have a new strong fence keeping them and that a wild animal couldn't get through unless it was very small, squirrel-sized, maybe raccoon, or literally broke the fence down. It is not broken down, and the animal that I saw or heard at the end was clearly larger than even the sheep. It looked the size of our grown Alma, who is not in that yard, and sounded like one of our horses galloping. Anyway, help? Explainable? Something supernatural? I live on the very southern edge of Killing, Texas. I am surrounded by huge ranches in the country. A couple months ago, I was on my way to the nearest gas station to grab a couple of beers for the night, and it is a little over four miles to get around the ranch. I live by to get to the gas station. It's central Texas with scrub oaks, cedars, cacti, yuccas, and such. So it's hilly and scrubby, but has its open areas. Anyway, about the midpoint of my trip, I get to a stop sign. Turn left and go up this hill. I'm accelerating and keep looking down at the speedometer to check my speed. I finally get to speed, turn on the cruise control so I don't have to worry about it, and then I go back to paying attention to my surroundings. There are a few things that bother me with this story, and it's why I've held off submitting it. As I crested the hill, still on my way to get some beer, I saw a glimmer man, plain and simple. I only noticed it as I crested the hill. It was on the left side of the road. It seemed to be upright, but quickly squatted to all four and ran across the road. I don't really think it was a man, though. I first noticed movement off to my left, actually on the left shoulder. It was a two-lane road. What I then saw was a figure. It squatted to all fours. It galloped across the road and crossed it in three gallops. It moved like it was bipedal, but was moving on all four. It seemed to be made of water, but a softer water, if that makes sense, and it was huge. I'm six foot tall, and it made me feel small. It was around two in the afternoon when this occurred. I think what I saw was the light reflecting off of the figure. That's how I was able to see it. Two other things bother me about this and make me question myself. They are. One, the thing I saw... Well, looked like a dogman. Well, that or the creature from the alien film franchise. I saw many teeth, long, muscular limbs, a slender torso, and what seemed to be pointed ears, but they were laid back. I saw the teeth, head, body, and limbs, which were distorted because they were moving so fast. I'm not going to lie. If I would have had something in my bladder, I'd have soiled myself. I still haven't come to terms with it. Two, this exact same spot. Not area, but spot. My grandson was in back of my Jeep. We were going to the same gas station. I had the top and doors off, which gives you a pretty good view of everything. So while traveling through this same spot, my grandson said he saw a kangaroo. This was approximately two years prior. I spent several months after his comments, scouring the area as I drove through, looking for a kangaroo. I've had no luck spotting one yet. Now that I'm retired from the Army, I've met people from everywhere. One of my close friends from Jay, Texas, used to have wallabies as pets when he was a kid, so not out of the realm of imagination. However, it's goats, cattle, and horses around here because the land is so rough. I kept close watch through there for months afterward to see if I could spot it. All I saw were roadrunners, turkeys, deer, and such. 
I have no clue what he could have seen. However, after much reflection, the only thing I can think of is the backward knees and upright stature. Maybe that's why I called it a kangaroo. My grandson was seven years old at the time. Since my sighting, I'll go to the gas station to grab a beer and bring my dog with me. She's a Great Dane or Catahoula mix and really just looks like a huge hound dog. Anyway, the first couple of times I took her through that very area, she'd go nuts as if she'd smelled something. She'd run back and forth from one side to the other. The third time last week, she started growling. When we went through there, I still didn't see anything but the area where she growled was the same place where the aforementioned instances occurred. I don't know what to make of it and haven't said anything to anyone. I'm just wondering what y'all think of it, or am I just going crazy and paranoid? The Alaskan wilderness has a way of swallowing you whole, embracing you in its icy grip and challenging your very existence. It's a place where only the strongest survive, where solitude becomes your closest companion. I am Jack Turner, a rugged individualist who has carved out a life of seclusion in a rustic cabin nestled deep within this unforgiving landscape. My days are defined by the rhythm of self-sufficiency. Chopping wood becomes a meditation, each swing of the axe a reminder of my resilience. Hunting provides sustenance, a reminder that I am a part of this wild world, and the tranquility that only isolation can offer becomes my solace, my refuge from a world that seems to grow more chaotic with each passing day. As the days grow shorter and the winter months stretch on, the snow-covered landscape closes in around me. The howling wind becomes a haunting symphony, and the dance of snowflakes outside my window is both mesmerizing and isolating. I find comfort in the routine and the simple acts that tether me to reality. But one evening, as the wind's howl grew louder and the snowflakes danced with newfound intensity, something shifted. I peered through the frosty window of my cabin and caught a glimpse of movement among the trees. At first, I dismissed it as a trick of my imagination, an illusion conjured by the isolation and the long hours spent in the quiet wilderness. Yet, as the days passed, I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched. Glimpses of the same dark, hulking shape appeared on the periphery of my vision, always just out of reach. It was a presence that seemed to defy explanation, a feeling that crawled beneath my skin and nestled in the pit of my stomach. I hesitated to share my experiences with the outside world, who would believe me a lone man, living in the heart of the wilderness, but I couldn't ignore the unsettling truth any longer. I began journaling my encounters, documenting every detail, every chilling observation. My descriptions painted a vivid picture, a towering figure covered in matted fur, eyes that gleamed with an otherworldly intelligence, and a presence that sent shivers down my spine. As the creature's appearances grew more frequent, my skepticism wavered. My rational mind clashed with the inexplicable reality I was facing. The isolation that had once brought me solace now deepened my uncertainty. I questioned the very foundation of my reality, grappling with the idea that there was more to this world than met the eye. Desperation drove me to seek answers in the stories of native Alaskan legends. Tales of similar creatures that inhabited the wilds echoed in the back of my mind, offering a sliver of validation for the inexplicable horrors I had witnessed. A turning point came during a stormy night when the wind howled like a banshee in the snow, swirled in a frenzy. With a heart pounding in my chest, I mustered the courage to confront the creature that had haunted my every waking moment. Armed with a flashlight and a camera, I ventured into the blizzard, determined to capture evidence of the elusive being that had invaded my world. And there, at the edge of the clearing, my flashlight's beam illuminated an imposing figure. Its features were obscured by the swirling snow, yet I felt its presence reverberate through my very being. In those fleeting moments, as I snapped photos in the blinding storm, I knew that what I had witnessed defied all logic. 
In the aftermath, I shared my story with a trusted friend and a researcher who treated my experiences with raw honesty. Despite my initial hesitation, I knew I had to speak my truth. With conviction, I declared, Bigfoot is real, and I wouldn't lie about it. My account ignited a blend of fascination and skepticism among those who heard my tale, blurring the line between reality and the unexplainable. As I look out at the snow-covered expanse that surrounds my cabin, I am reminded that some mysteries are destined to remain hidden in the heart of the wilderness. The world may doubt my story, but I carry with me the knowledge that I have stared into the abyss and witnessed something that transcends understanding. The Alaskan wilderness is a place of wonder and terror, a realm where the line between reality and myth blurs, and the truth is as elusive as the creatures that roam its depths. Growing up, I remember my father telling me stories about his days as a logger. He was a strong, hard-working man, and he loved his job. But there was one story he would tell that always left me with a sense of unease, a story about a strange encounter he had in the woods. It was late autumn, and the logging season was coming to a close. My father and his crew were working hard to finish up their last few jobs before the winter snows arrived. One evening, as the sun dipped below the horizon, my father decided to head back to camp early to prepare dinner for the crew. As he drove along the winding forest road, he suddenly spotted a large, hairy man dart out of the woods and across the road just a few feet in front of his truck. My father slammed on the brakes, his heart racing in his chest as he tried to make sense of what he had just seen. The creature was massive, covered in thick, matted hair, and running on two legs like a human but with a speed and agility that seemed almost unnatural. As quickly as it had appeared, the creature vanished into the woods on the other side of the road. My father sat in his truck, his hands gripping the steering wheel tightly as he tried to process what he had just witnessed. He knew he couldn't keep this to himself, so he drove back to the logging site and told his fellow lumberjacks what had happened. To his surprise, many of them believed his story. They had heard whispers of strange creatures living in the woods. Creatures that were not quite human, but not quite animal either. Together they decided to form a search party and see if they could find any trace of the creature my father had encountered. Armed with flashlights and a sense of determination, they set off into the woods, following the path the creature had taken as it crossed the road. They searched for hours, their flashlights casting eerie shadows among the trees, but they found no sign of the creature. As the night wore on and the temperature dropped, they eventually decided to abandon their search and return to camp. My father couldn't shake the feeling that the creature was still out there, watching them from the shadows, but he knew there was little they could do to find it. The story of my father's encounter with the strange, hairy man spread throughout the logging community, and while some dismissed it as a tall tale or a trick of the light, others believed it to be true. My father never saw the creature again, but the memory of that night stayed with him for the rest of his life. As I grew older, I found myself wondering about the mysterious creature that had crossed my father's path all those years ago. Was it a figment of his imagination, or could it have been something more? I suppose I'll never know the truth, but the story remains a haunting reminder of the mysteries that still lurk within the depths of the forest. My brother is two years older, and we've probably spent 10,000 hours and then some in the woods together. Whether it was building Fort's BMX tracks to LARPing and hunting, we've traveled across the U.S. exploring caves, canyons, cliff diving, mountain biking, camping, hunting whitetail mule deer, wild boar, etc. Since 2016, when we get the time off, I feel like adding this is important because there's genuinely nothing I wouldn't do or fear when I have him by my side. But this time was different, and we both felt it. We've had our fair share of adventures and stories to tell of all sorts. But this one has felt like a lingering stain on my memory. We were both mid-twenties-ish, and it was 2019, and 
This was probably my fifth time hunting the area, and the first I brought my brother along. It's a large forest area of public land that has a few county roads, which are basically two tracks that stretch miles throughout the area. We make the trip up in my truck with our tents, three in total, one for each of us and another to change in and keep our gear in. Without making this long-winded, we set up camp a couple miles from the truck, which we drove for quite a few miles through the trails. Basically, middle of nowhere. Nearest main road is probably eight, ten miles away. We arrived late in the night, set up camp, and quickly fell asleep after a long trip. We then spent the next day scouting tracking, then made back to camp for the night. We cooked then ate, had some beers, and bullshitted. The night was still early, but we had a long day and decided to head off for the night. Everything up until this point was normal. I was suddenly awoke to something smacking my tent and hearing my brother's voice call my name. I knew something was off. I called back to him and he immediately unzipped my tent and made his way inside. I could tell he was disturbed when I went to ask him what's wrong, and he immediately grabbed my shoulder and told me to shush. The sun wasn't up yet, so I think it was around 4.35ish a.m. We sat in my tent, and what we heard still confuses me to this day. I can only explain it as whale sounds, different tones of extremely loud noise that I could feel throughout my body. It would come and go, but there would only be a few seconds of silence in between the sounds. It would vary from high-pitched squeals and everything in between to very low sounds that had literal ground-shaking reverb. I regrettably didn't think to grab my phone or record anything that was going on because what I was hearing didn't seem real, and in the moment, I was awestruck. The sound went on until daylight started to break. I believe it was about an hour, but I'm not really sure. Neither of us spoke, and at the time, it felt like I could feel the energy around me, almost like my body was covered in white noise, if that makes any sense. It wasn't even minutes after the sound stopped. It started to rain, and one of the craziest thunderstorms while I was camping happened. The forecast didn't predict or account for any rain. The days we were going to be there prior to making the trip. All the stakes for the tent, our gear was in completely ripped out of the ground, and both of our tents had multiple stakes ripped out as well. Those things were drove into the ground with an axe and would take some insane force to unearth even a single one. My brother dismisses it and won't even talk about it, saying it was just machinery being dragged, but at the time we both shared the same feeling of fear and dread. Just seems odd it was still of the middle of the night and we were so far removed from any nearby community's industry to hear and experience this occurrence. I, 27 female, live in a small town in North Italy, a valley between our typical old mountains, round shapes covered in forest, not high, So just behind my home, lots of hikes start. I always lived here, and I like mountains. Plus, I'm getting in shape, so the terrain is ideal. Especially because I'm really familiar with it. So last summer, I was walking my usual route when I thought I could try to have a short hike before sunset and took a rot. Now, I don't know if you're familiar with Italian ground, but there aren't the big spaces and long distances. Typically of U.S., I imagine. Picture the average small town of 2,500 people. Starting from bottom in a two-hour hike, you're on top of the mountain. And the route I took was about 30 minutes to arrive halfway the mountain to a big Christian cross and a nice view. I was with my dog, a well-trained Spitz, a nice company with good instincts that I trust. He's a working dog more than a pet, despite his size. So we took the path and start making our way up, nice and relaxed, but active as we didn't have too much light time left. I just figured that if light went low, I'd just turn around and head home. No chances of getting lost. Woods immediately engulf us. Pretty dense, but it's the norm. Not even 15 minutes of walking and I'm paralyzed with this overwhelming sense of dread. The woods are completely silent. My skin crawls up just thinking about it. Even my dog stops, anxious. I just couldn't understand what was scaring me so much in the sudden silence. I couldn't move a muscle. 
I've read The Gift of Fear. And the only time I didn't listen to my guts, I lost my spleen in an accident. So wide-eyed and hyper-alert, I forced myself to move and noped out of there. It was like my brain was screaming, if you stay here, you'll die. Walking back, I couldn't stop the urge to continuously look behind me. At some point, I was practically running, and I kept thinking that if I sprained an ankle there, I would die. The dog seemed relieved when we had turned back, and he kept looking behind, too. When we finally made it out of the woods and back on the road, I felt a wave of relief and ran all the way back home for the adrenaline I had. To this day, I don't know what happened, and I haven't gone back. When I was growing up, we lived near a town called Wilty in Oklahoma. It's really not much of a town, just a tiny store, some churches, and a lot of farms. We lived off the main road, close to an area called Macabre, which is also nothing but farms and a cemetery, and not even considered a town. Very middle of nowhere. My family told a lot of creepy stories about this place, especially having to do with orbs and weird deer. I do have memories of seeing orbs floating over the trees and have no idea what those were, but I never personally saw anything else. My dad has always been a skeptic and never chimed in on these stories. He has Alzheimer's and has a great memory of the past, but horrible short term. The other day he was telling me how much he loved living out there and wished he could still live there, and I brought up the orbs and the creepy stories my family always shared. He agreed that they were always creeped out out there, but then he told me he actually saw something really odd once. He told me one night he was sitting on the porch by himself, and a man ran through our yard wearing what looked like a deer head. Not just the antlers, but like he had a deer's head. He just ran through and continued on down the pitch black road. My dad didn't know what to think of it. He just told me he thought people out there had too much time on their hands. My mom and brother also saw what they said was a deer walking upright all the way down the road. I know deer do this, but they said it, it just kept walking like that in the middle of the road. My aunt also said they passed a man who was wearing a deer's head on the road one night. There aren't street lights in this area, so he was just out there in the dark road alone, just standing there. It was late November 1994, and my husband and I decided to go hiking to Bagby Hot Springs in Oregon. The weather was chilly, and a thick layer of snow covered the ground. We were both excited to get away from the city and immerse ourselves in the tranquility of nature. As we hiked along the well-trodden trail, I noticed something peculiar, barefoot tracks in the deep snow. The tracks were quite large, about 14, 16 inches long and 6, 8 inches wide at the ball. What struck me as odd was the absence of any claw marks and the fact that the smaller toes seemed almost non-existent. The stride was long and the tracks followed a generally straight line up the trail, although they occasionally crossed back over, as if the creature had doubled back. I decided not to mention the tracks to my husband, who was a skeptic when it came to anything out of the ordinary. Surprisingly, he didn't bring them up either. We continued our hike, but my curiosity about the tracks only grew stronger. As we neared the hot springs, we encountered a park ranger named Jake. I couldn't help but ask him if he had seen or heard anything unusual in the area. He was a tall, sturdy man with a weathered face that suggested he had spent years working in the wilderness. Jake looked at me thoughtfully for a moment before replying. You know, I've heard some stories from other hikers about strange tracks in the snow. I've seen them myself a few times. Some folks think it's a prank, while others believe it might be something more mysterious, like a Bigfoot. My husband chuckled at the mention of Bigfoot, but Jake didn't seem to find it amusing. Look... I can't say for sure what's making those tracks, but I'd advise you both to be careful out here, he warned. The wilderness can be unpredictable, and it's best to stay alert. We thanked Jake for his advice and continued on our way to the hot springs. The rest of our hike was uneventful, but the memory of those tracks lingered in my mind.
It was early morning in September as I walked through the dense forest, about a quarter mile off Wildcat Mountain Road. I was on a mission to track the movement of an elk herd that returned to this area every seven days to feed. The sun had just begun to peek through the trees, casting a golden glow on the forest floor. I had been hiking for a while when I met a seasoned hunter named Joe. He was also tracking the elk and had been doing so for years. We decided to team up and continue our observation together. As we moved deeper into the woods, Joe shared fascinating stories about his experiences as a hunter and his encounters with various wildlife. Suddenly, from the next canyon over, we heard a high-pitched whistle that pierced the stillness of the morning air. The sound was incredibly loud and lasted for about 20 seconds. Joe, being very familiar with the sounds of the forest, was puzzled by this whistle. He assured me that it was neither an elk nor a cat. The peculiar whistle set off a frenzy of barking from dogs at nearby homes, which continued for about five minutes. Joe and I exchanged worried glances before deciding to cautiously investigate the source of the strange sound. As we approached the next canyon, we stumbled upon something we never expected to see. A large, hairy creature standing on two legs, its eyes fixed on us. We were both frozen in shock, unable to move or speak. The creature appeared to be a Sasquatch, a legendary being that had been the subject of countless tales and rumors, but never proven to exist. The Sasquatch seemed just as surprised to see us, and it let out another high-pitched whistle before disappearing into the dense forest. Joe and I stared at each other in disbelief, our hearts pounding in our chests. We knew that we had just witnessed something extraordinary something that would change the way we viewed the world and the creatures that inhabited it. The encounter with the Sasquatch overshadowed our original mission to observe the elk herd, and we spent the rest of the day discussing our experience and pondering the existence of this mysterious creature. As we parted ways, Joe and I agreed to keep our encounter a secret, knowing that most people would dismiss our story as a fabrication or an exaggeration. But deep in our hearts, we knew the truth. We had come face to face with a legend, a creature that had eluded mankind for centuries. And although our encounter was brief, it would remain etched in our memories for the rest of our lives. On August 1st, 1987, I, Officer Torgan responded to a call about a possible drunk driver. When I arrived at the scene, a white male in his early 20s took off running. The incident occurred around 1 a.m. along Highway 44 near Ellington, Missouri. I requested backup and began searching the area, but I couldn't find any footprints or tire tracks that the suspect might have left behind. I remember thinking, this is one of the strangest things I've ever put in a report. I returned to my patrol vehicle when suddenly I heard a high-pitched humming sound. To my shock, a large humanoid creature with an extremely fit and strong build stood before me. Its eyes were a deep, piercing black, resembling the pupil, less appearance of a shark. The creature's arms hung down, giving it an ape-like look while its head was humanoid in shape. The nose was pushed flat against its face with a heavy brow, perhaps from a fall during its lifetime. Its wide mouth was filled with numerous tiny, razor-sharp teeth. Long strands of stringy hair hung from the back of its head, reaching midway down its back. I observed that the creature seemed to have been living in the woods as its skin was dirty, matted, and gray. It stood about eight feet tall and had very wide shoulders, maybe twice the width of a human's. I was so frightened by the sight that I didn't even think to pursue it. Instead, I simply got back into my patrol car, returned to the station, and filled out a report which I never intended to release, at least publicly. I described the creature as one of the strangest things I've ever put in a report. When it stood before me, it looked like something right out of a horror movie. I know for certain that I saw something very unusual on the night of July 26 while driving home from work. I hadn't been drinking and was completely sober. I also don't drink caffeine or take any type of stimulant or depressant drugs. When my wife saw the tracks, she initially thought they were left by a bear, 
but we later learned there were no bears in the area. In our front yard, we have a large maple tree with low-hanging branches. The creature I saw at the window was definitely not a bear. It stood on two legs, very unlike how a bear stands, and reached with its arms as if to touch me. It was only about five feet away from the window when we made full eye contact. The experience was terrifying. I don't know for sure what I saw, and my wife is just as certain that she saw it too. I've never seen any type of creature resembling that thing before in my life, and I hope to never see one again. Clearly, I'm not alone in this experience, as others like Officer Torgan have shared similar stories. There are things out there that defy the world we live in. Maybe shows like X-Files and Twilight Zone had it right. Back in the mid-90s, I had a close friend named John who shared my passion for hiking and camping. One weekend, John and his wife, Emily, decided to hike to Indian Prairie Lake to camp and fish for a couple of days. I was unable to join them due to a prior engagement, but they promised to share their adventure with me upon their return. When they came back, their faces were pale and their hands trembled as they recounted their experience. They told me that the area around the lake had been unusually quiet and still, and they couldn't shake the eerie feeling of being watched. As John waded into the lake to cast his fishing line, their normally aggressive dog, Bear, followed him, whining and trying to wrap himself around John's legs. They felt so spooked that they decided to leave after only a short time. A few weeks later, their high school aged son, Jake, and his friends decided to camp at the same lake. They, too, experienced the same sense of unease, and once again, Bear freaked out, this time retreating to the safety of their tent and refusing to come out. Despite the unsettling atmosphere, the boys were determined to stay the night. As darkness fell, they were harassed by something that screamed in the night. They also heard the sound of something being thrown at them. Terrified, they broke camp and left in the wee hours of the morning. I couldn't help but feel intrigued and concerned about the strange occurrences at Indian Prairie Lake. As a former Navy SEAL, my friend Randy was always up for a challenge, so I told him about the mysterious happenings and asked if he wanted to investigate with me. Without hesitation, he agreed. We arrived at the lake determined to uncover the truth behind the unsettling events. The air was heavy with silence, and we couldn't shake the feeling that we were being watched. We set up camp and waited, Bear lying nervously at our feet. As night fell, we took turns keeping watch. It wasn't long before we heard the same blood-curdling scream that John's son and his friends had described. Randy and I grabbed our flashlights and ventured out into the darkness, Bear reluctantly following behind. We searched the area but found no signs of what could have produced the scream. However, as we returned to our campsite, we noticed large, unusual footprints near the edge of the lake. They were unlike anything we had ever seen. We continued our investigation the following day, discovering more footprints and what appeared to be evidence of something large moving through the underbrush. As a Navy SEAL, Randy was skilled in tracking, and he was baffled by what he saw. Despite our best efforts, we were unable to determine the source of the strange happenings at Indian Prairie Lake. To this day, the mystery remains unsolved. Years later, I heard that Jake had joined the Marines and was stationed in the Middle East. I often wonder if he still thinks about that eerie night at Indian Prairie Lake and the unknown force that had driven him in and his friends away in fear. I've been a ranger for well over 30 years. At some point, they decided that they would take some of the workload off my feet and let me do most of my work at the visitor center, which is about a third of the way into the natural reserve. My body appreciates their consideration for the condition that I'm in, but my mental health doesn't. Keeping on the move and always on patrol was my way of coping with things. Working out of the visitor center gave me more time to think. And that's not necessarily a healthy thing. Suffice to say, I'm divorced and my kids, well, they don't want to talk to me, all while I'm facing my twilight years all by myself. 
I'm not trying to draw attention here. Those will be necessary details in just a few short seconds. They forced me to take coffee breaks if I had to go too hard for too long. I was taking one such compulsory coffee break on one of the outdoor wooden park benches completely by myself. People don't come to the park to look around the visitor center anymore. Besides the brochures of park information, the only thing the park has to offer is the same four or five fun facts, and they've been hanging out for a long time. In fact, everybody has seen them. Nobody wants to see them again. I was quickly yanked out of my thoughts when I heard a voice that I hadn't heard for over 15 years, but recognized it instantly. It was the voice of my ex-wife, and she was calling my name. My brain was trying to come up with a rational explanation as to why I was hearing this. And then I heard my daughter's voice come out to me also. Except she didn't sound like the 43-year-old woman that she had grown into. Instead, she sounded exactly the way she did when she was around nine years old. I was anchored to the park bench for a while, terrified to move. Just in case I was having a heart attack or a stroke or experiencing something else that would mess with my mind... Perhaps I was dying. Perhaps this was a practical joke. But who could mimic those voices so well and know my name at the same time? I decided to try a more tactical approach. I would come towards the voices, but I wouldn't answer them. There were long pauses between each call as if my wife and daughter were waiting for me to answer. But then they would call out again. And it was in those moments that I would pick up on the direction that they were coming from. Unless my ears were lying to me, it sounded like they were coming from the woods that came right up against the physical building of the visitor center. I stepped to the trees quietly, resting when there was silence and walking when I heard the voices. I approached the opening in the trees. They couldn't have been more than 14 feet in diameter. It was also clustered by some low-growing shrubs. I remained hidden as best as possible. It didn't sound like the voices were coming from nearby. They were coming from that very small clearing. I didn't see how it could be possible. If my wife and daughter were there, they'd be visible clearly, unless they were lying down on the shrubbery. So I stared for what felt like forever. But then, a shape slowly rose out of the growth, and it appeared to have two large block eyes that were proportionate to its head the same way the eyes of a fly are proportionate to its head. Everything about it was just a little too long. The neck, the shoulders, the arms. It did not stand up to its full length, just high enough to get a good look around before opening its mouth and speaking with both the voices of my wife and my daughter in one, calling out to me, asking where I was and what was taking so long. Then, without noticing me, it slowly sank back down. I could see its pale ribbed back bent over and underneath the topmost of the leaves where it did its best to try and stay hidden. I took up my pistol and I shot as many times as I could before I realized that there was a problem. At least two good hits landed on its flesh before it sprang up and ran. I don't know if the other three or four shots hit. Miraculously, I was able to slip back into the center and not have to offer an explanation to anybody important. The older girl there, that works behind the front desk, asked if she had heard something dangerous, and I just told her that I saw some kids setting off fireworks. My ex-wife may be many things, but somebody with the ability, let alone the intelligence, to send some strange forced monster after me and lure me out with the sound of her voice isn't one of them. After that incident, I've kind of given in to the urging of my superiors to spend more time in that area and less time tromping around outside. There are clearly more forces at work in this world that know more about me and know me better than I know myself, and the less I have to tangle with them, the better. I apologize in advance for my story being so long, but I figured I would give you the unfiltered version. Thank you. It was 2008 in San Antonio, Texas. I was on patrol alone one night when I heard a loud thumping sound coming from the back of my squad car. I stopped, got out to investigate, and then suddenly I was faced with something that seemed to come straight out of a horror film. I was terrified and shaken, and this is my story. 
The district I was patrolling was new to me. It was around 2.20 a.m., and I had just finished checking several convenience stores when the loud thumping sound from the back of my car caused me to pull over. As I stepped out of the vehicle, a large figure burst out from the woods across the street and started running towards me. For a split second, I thought it was a person, but as it got closer, I realized with a chill that it wasn't. The creature was on all fours, covered in hair, with the body of a man and the head of a wolf. It seemed to be wearing a uniform, but as I squinted through the darkness, I realized it was just its thick, matted fur. The creature stopped about thirty feet from me, its eyes boring into mine as though sizing me up. Fear rooted me to the spot. I slammed on my car horn for what seemed like an eternity, hoping someone would come, but no one did. Suddenly the creature started to charge at me. Overcoming my initial shock, I jumped back into my car and sped off. I was too frightened to share my encounter with anyone. I was afraid they wouldn't believe me, that they would think I was crazy. But now, as similar sightings are being reported all over the world, I've decided it's time to share my experience. I hope that my story encourages other officers who have had similar encounters to come forward. In the summer of 94, I found myself in the heart of Oregon's mountainous region. I was working for a geological service back then and had taken a friend along for a horseback ride near Husband Lake, close to Linton Meadow. We were about seven miles out on the Cascade Crest Trail, a rugged path accessible from where Road 1624 ended. The trail was flanked by a swampy area on one side and a steep 400-foot cliff on the other, coming off Husband Mountain. As we were riding along, something strange at the top of the ridge caught our eyes. There was a stump there, or at least that's what we initially thought it to be. But then, to our disbelief, the stump moved. It stood up there and watched us, I remember saying to my friend in hushed whispers. The figure was at an almost impossible angle, precariously leaning over the cliff edge, seemingly trying to get a better look at us. Then, almost as if it was aware that we were watching, it started to retreat in slow motion, gradually disappearing from our sight. However, this wasn't the last we saw of it. Twice more, it reappeared along the trail. One time, it had its foot rested on a boulder. That was when our horses began to act up sidestepping and dancing nervously. They were clearly spooked, and we were in a hurry to get down the trail, away from the mysterious figure. The creature was silhouetted against the sky, the sun casting its form in shadow. We couldn't see any specific details, but its size was unmistakable. It was a massive figure, easily twice the size of a man, and appeared to be heavily muscled. Its fur or skin was dark brown. It resembled descriptions I've heard of the fabled dogman. After that encounter, I became convinced that there was a family of these creatures in the area. I don't know if they're dogmen or Bigfoot or something else entirely, but I do know that they are out there. And every time I venture into those mountains, I can't shake the feeling that we are being watched by those curious hidden eyes. It was the 14th of October and my son, Peter, and I found ourselves hunting in the woods northeast of Lincoln City, Oregon. The air was crisp, and the rustle of autumn leaves echoed through the forest, creating an eerie yet familiar atmosphere. We've always enjoyed these father-son excursions, a tradition passed down through generations. But that day we were to stumble upon something that would etch itself into our memories forever. As we moved deeper into the woods, we noticed a peculiar sight. A large section of the forest floor had been disturbed. Numerous roots, each one large and white as though freshly exposed to the air, were pulled up from the ground. That wasn't the strange part. What baffled us was the arrangement of these roots. Each one of them was laid in a row along the path we were following, all facing the same direction. The roots were intact displaying a systematic arrangement that seemed too deliberate to be the work of animals. It was as if something or someone had carefully uprooted and arranged these roots with a specific intent. 
Peter and I exchanged puzzled glances, our curiosity piqued. We were familiar with the woods and its residents, but this was something we had never seen before. It was unsettling, and we felt a sense of unease creeping over us. Nevertheless, we decided to press on, keeping a mental note of the strange roots. The next day, we returned to the same spot, half expecting the roots to be gone, perhaps carried off by some animal or scattered by the wind. But they were still there, undisturbed, laid out in the same meticulous order as the day before. To this day, we don't know what caused this strange occurrence. Was it some bizarre, natural phenomenon? Or was it the work of an unknown creature in the woods? We can only speculate. But one thing is certain. The woods of Lincoln City hold mysteries that go beyond our comprehension. And that day we had come face to face with one of them. This just happened last night. My boyfriend, our husky, and I embarked upon our long holiday road trip to see our families earlier today. Fourteen hours of this trip takes place on a major U.S. interstate highway. We were looking for places to make our last gas stop and found a place just off the highway. We pulled off and into the desolate gas station and immediately were greeted by a fairly large, somewhat sketchy man taking not-so-subtle glances in our direction. We both were joking that maybe we chose the wrong gas station. And boy, did we. My boyfriend suggested that while he pumped the gas and run to the restroom, I'd take our dog and let him stretch his legs. Being a city girl, I know to always carry my mace and phone, especially at night. We diverged as I started to make my way towards the ill-lit side of the gas station and my boyfriend to the restroom. I made it not thirty feet from my car and was approached by a small Chihuahua mutt with a collar who happily greeted our husky. I looked around for an owner while the two dogs got to know one another and continued to walk to a patch of grass with our new follower in tow. My first instinct was to help the dog and find his owner, but in the back of my mind something felt very off, and to be honest it felt off since the moment we pulled in. I immediately called my boyfriend and told him I had found a dog and said, Hey, I found a dog, but something is weird. He immediately abandoned his bathroom break and came out to meet me. While I'm standing with our dog and this dog who came seemingly out of nowhere, I felt eyes on me from the employees working outside. My boyfriend expressed concern about the dog being loose so close to a major highway and further looked around for its possible owner. He approached one of the employees who was changing out trash liners right next to our car for some time now. He asked the employee if he had any idea whose dog this was. In perfect English, he replied, I don't speak English, and anxiously turned around to only continue to go through the motions of changing out a trash liner he had been standing at this whole time. He then continued to watch his chase around this dog until a dog led us behind the conscience store gas station. With my boyfriend five feet behind me, I followed the dog to the back of the store. Behind the store, ten or so big rig trucks sat largely in darkness, resting for the night. Cardboard boxes and broken wood pallets covered the dirt. A large man in a gas station uniform greeted me staring through a glass door. With my boyfriend out of view, I bent down to check the dog's tag as the man continued to stare. My boyfriend approached, and that's when the man behind the glass door's demeanor changed. Almost dejectedly, he opened the glass door. I quickly asked, Do you know whose dog this is? Nervously, he fumbled his words and replied, Yeah, uh, yeah, that's my bad dog. We both exhaled and exchanged a look as if to say something about that was really weird. We made our way back to the car, and my boyfriend remembered he had to still use the bathroom, so I settled back into our locked car. When my boyfriend got back to the car, he told me the same man we talked to at the back of the store, followed him to the bathroom, and stood behind him watching. That's when we realized just how creepy and surreal the last fifteen minutes had been. As we drove away, we discussed the strange and creepy series of events how the whole thing felt staged or set up. Why did the employee act like he didn't know the dog when it belonged to his co-worker? 
We immediately googled the small town we had stopped in and discovered it has been a hot spot for human trafficking. In recent months, 60 people were arrested. Was this just a string of eerie coincidences, or was there some more sinister going on here? It was an early Tuesday morning. My friend and I were bow hunting off the face of the rock quarry. We stopped to rest on a bench in the tall timber where we sat facing up the hill. We had come down from earlier in the morning. We couldn't rest because we kept hearing a rustling sound up the hillside that kept our attention. Shortly thereafter, we thought we heard what sounded like girls talking on the 1160. One rode directly above us. It first sounded like laughing that immediately turned into a blood-curdling sound that went to a soft laughter, to a very high pitch that got louder and louder. My first thought was it sounded like a mother watching its young being killed. This sound got so loud in its direction, now sounded like from multiple directions around us, like something was joining in on the cry. By this time, approximately 20 seconds has gone by, and the sound has not stopped for one second, not even to take a breath of air. My friend kept asking me, what is it, as I was staring up the hillside in amazement. He finally was so scared, he grabbed my shirt and looked me in the eye and said, what is it? I replied, I don't know, but it better not come after us. This sound started to wind down like an old World War II hand crank warning alarm and then dissipated into a soft sound, then to nothing. We estimated this sound carried for approximately 40 seconds, and like I said, it never stopped to take a breath. The northwestern part of Pennsylvania, particularly the areas surrounding the Allegheny National Forest, has a rich history of reports about UFOs, Bigfoot, and other inexplicable events. It was in this intriguing setting on July 8, 2017, that my partner and I had an encounter that left us both bewildered. That morning at around nine, I stepped out onto our deck, which overlooks the lush greenery of our country home, nestled near the forest. What caught my eye was an unusually large moth resting on a six-by-six six vertical post. The moth, if I could even call it that, was approximately 11 inches long and about five inches wide at what I can only describe as the shoulders. Its shape was peculiar, somewhat reminiscent of an hourglass. Adding to its unusual appearance were two appendages at the top of its head, antennas or pointed ears, perhaps, each about an inch long. It seemed as though the creature's head was tucked into its body, as if it was resting. Based on its size, I guessed its wingspan would reach an impressive 15 inches when fully spread out. Intrigued, I called my husband to witness this peculiar sight. I was taken aback by the creature's strange beauty. Its wings shimmered with a pale green iridescence, while the middle part appeared to have a creamy skin-like texture. My husband was equally amazed, expressing that he'd never seen anything like it before. We both agreed that it resembled a giant moth. We spent some time observing the seemingly slumbering creature. Eventually, I gathered the courage to touch it, finding its wings smooth, almost skin-like, but not feathery or fuzzy. The creature remained still, not reacting to my touch. I also noticed a lack of the powdery residue typically left behind after touching a moth's wings. Before we had to leave our home for a bit, I decided to fetch my camera to capture a picture of our unusual visitor. Standing about a foot away, I tried to power up my camera, but to no avail. Despite the camera having never given us trouble before, and even after replacing the batteries, it still refused to turn on. The next day, it worked perfectly fine again. On our way to the car, we spotted another similar creature perched on the outer wall of our home about ten feet off the ground. When we returned home later, both creatures had vanished. We've since made a sketch of what we saw. It shows the back of the creature's wings, and the red area behind it represents the six-by-six six vertical post it was resting on. It's possibly just a coincidence that my camera malfunctioned when I tried to photograph this odd-winged creature. 
However, I've heard of cases where photographic equipment mysteriously fails when someone attempts to capture images of UFOs or other phenomena. More recently, similar incidents have been reported in connection with significant UFO encounters in our state. Other researchers involved in paranormal investigations have reported similar experiences as well. This happened ages ago when I was 20. One, I was a manager for a big box store, but in a town that was an hour drive from me. I lived in a small town, and the store was in another small town, both about 12,000 people each. But in order to promote the manager, I had to transfer, which meant doing this drive daily. I had hoped it would be temporary because I dreaded driving this every day, especially late at night because of deer, etc., this was also before cell phones were really the norm. I did have one, but it was one of those ancient bag-style phones, and I just got it a week or two before. With these phones, you had to plug them into your car lighter in order to have them work, and they had a corded attached handset. Anyway, one night I was driving home, and it was really late, about 1 a.m. The drive is pretty desolate with houses sporadically throughout mixed with sections of wooded areas. About 20 minutes before my town is a random casino in the middle of BFE. I had just passed this casino and a truck pulled out behind me. I didn't think anything of it, but it was noticeable pretty quickly that they had been drinking because of their erratic driving. Because of this, I just figured. I just put as much room between us as possible. Also to note. As I was going past them, they had their headlights on, of course, and could have easily seen I was a young girl by myself. So the truck comes up behind me at a pretty fast rate of speed and goes to pass me. As they are next to me, they swerve a little towards me, and I just think they are much more drunk than I thought, and slowed down so they could easily pass. As soon as they got in front of me, though, they started to slow down, way down. It got to the point that we were going 20 miles per hour in a 55 miles per hour zone and still slowing down like they were trying to stop me. Every time they would get to around 5 miles per hour, I would swerve to the opposite lane and give it some gas like I was going to pass, which would then make them temporarily speed up. I could also see a lot better in the truck at this point. It was an extended cab truck with what appeared to be 5 or 6 guys in it. This was during hunting season, so it wasn't out of the norm to see groups of guys acting ridiculous and drunk this time of year. So they were trying to stop me, and I didn't want to necessarily pass given what had just happened, but at a certain point I had to. So I go to try and pass the truck, but it blocks me from doing so by getting in the middle of both lanes. I try this a couple of times with the same results. Then finally, I try to floor it and pass in the truck, but it tries to run me off the road. I immediately get back behind them, and I'm freaking out at this point. I had tried calling 911, but there was a huge area with no coverage yet, and I couldn't get through. After what seemed like forever, I finally get through to them, and they send someone out immediately. As I'm on the phone with him, I see car lights in my rear view and am filled with panic because I know this car will inevitably try to pass, given we are only going about 30 at this point. Sure as shit, the car comes up behind us and goes to pass. And sure as shit, the truck actually runs them off the road and into the ditch. I'm telling the 911 dispatcher this, and in a full-blown panic, we are getting close to town now, though, and I can see the first stoplight. I wasn't sure what the truck was going to do because our one lane splits into two, and there are gas stations, etc., up ahead. Right as we approach the first light, I see an officer come in the opposite direction, and I start flashing them over and over while telling the dispatcher that I see the officer. The officer makes a U-turn and gets in between me and the truck, he flicks the lights on them to pull them over, and they pull into a gas station at the main intersection of our town. I follow into the gas station to assist the police in whatever statements they may need, and want to make sure these assholes are actually arrested. That didn't end up being a problem because they refused a breathalyzer, so they were taken to the hospital where a blood alcohol level was obtained. I really wanted to know more, but the officer didn't elaborate. 
I kind of wish I would have called up and followed up on it. They never called me or anything to do anything in court, so I'm guessing they didn't need me, but it also means that they got away with only getting a DUI. I didn't realize this wasn't okay until way later, much too late to have done anything about it. All I know is the officer said they were all three sheets to the wind. God only knows what their intent was, but I was terrified to find out, and thank God for that damn bag cell phone. It could have saved my life. My ex-wife and I saw in plain sight a female cross the road in front of our car. We had to stop very quickly or we would hit her. This happened at around 9.30 p.m. We went back there the next morning and found where two, three had been standing, watching traffic to cross the road. From 2000 through 2004, I heard many different calls from my bedroom from various times. The oddest at 9.30 a.m. This was the loudest call I had heard, and it sounded like it was lost or looking for a younger one that was lost. I have never heard a creature with such a lung capacity. The volume was incredible, and that was in broad daylight about half mile from my home. It woke me up immediately, and I knew right away what it was. I have excellent audio tape recordings that I recorded as I heard them through a magnified microphone. Many times I had walked in the woods by the house and I felt the presence of them around me. I also found many footprints in the largest pile of feces that I had ever seen, and my dog was very leery of that. My wife and I had planned a peaceful getaway to a cabin in a rural town nestled in the mountains. It was a much-needed break from our busy lives, and we were excited to enjoy the serenity of nature. It was around 8 p.m. when we heard an air raid siren, which we assumed was related to a fire. The sound pierced the quiet evening, and it rang out for quite some time. We initially joked about it being the beginning of a zombie apocalypse, but as time passed, we couldn't help but feel a little uneasy. We didn't know what the siren was for, and our curiosity got the better of us. Deciding it was best to find out what was going on, I put on my coat and boots before venturing out into the chilly night. I walked down the road to a small grocery store nearby, hoping someone there might know the reason for the siren. As I entered the store, the warm air and bright lights provided a welcome contrast to the cold darkness outside. I approached the counter and asked the store clerk if they knew what the siren was for. To my surprise, they looked at me with a puzzled expression and replied, What siren? I couldn't believe that they hadn't heard it. I stepped back outside, expecting to hear the siren again, but it had stopped. The eerie silence that had returned was unsettling. I made my way back to the cabin, trying to make sense of what had just happened. Upon my return, I shared the strange encounter with my wife. We were both left with a lingering sense of unease, but we tried to brush it off and enjoy the rest of our stay. However, we couldn't help but wonder about that mysterious siren and why nobody else seemed to have heard it. The mystery of that night would stay with us long after we left the mountain. A few years back, I had this really creepy experience with an older co-worker of mine that still kind of shakes me to this day. It happened at this place that I'd been working at for a couple of years at that point. The place was a small factory of sorts, with only less than a handful of employees, including myself. One day, though, my boss introduced us to this new, older guy that he'd brought in to start working in the other, newer side of the factory. You see, the factory where he worked had two different sides to it. One side for beeswax and one side for wood production. My boss had brought him in because they went to church together and the wood production on the other side had a religious significance. The new older co-worker worked there with us for about one month before he approached me one day and introduced himself to me. He seemed like a nice guy and even came back to give me a Hershey kiss. Not long after that, 
A couple months later, I got asked by our boss if I could go pick up my new, older co-worker, probably because his car was broken down or something. I agreed to it, so my boss asked me if it was okay to give the co-worker my phone number so that we could coordinate via text. I said it was fine and went on my way. I brought him back to the factory with no problems. Soon after that, though, I started to get random and sporadic texts from him late at night. At first, the texts were just about us, maybe hanging out soon, while simultaneously apologizing to me because he knew he was much older than I. But then the texts started to get pretty pervy, and they would be as long as a mini-book. The texts were just long, misspelled, random, pervy compilations. I tried to just ignore the texts, but that only made them start coming more frequently. In the midst of all this one day, my roommates were scrounging for a ride to a casino only a few miles from our house. I gave them a few dollars for a ride, and they said that they'd find their own ride back. So imagine my surprise when they returned only a couple hours later with their own ride, all right. Their ride was my creepy co-worker. Not only was I creeped the hell out that this pervy jerk now knew where I lived, but I also didn't know how he came to give my roommates that ride. Was it just sheer coincidence or something more? A few days after that, I went to visit a friend at his apartment that was located on our main street running through our small, historic downtown area. When I came downstairs from his apartment as he was located on the second floor, I made my usual turn, walking on the sidewalk in front of all the main street shops. As I walked past one of the shops that was maybe two doors down from my friend's apartment, I thought I saw something out of the corner of my eye, but it couldn't be. Could it? To my great dismay, it was him, my creepy-ass older co-worker standing in the doorway of one of the shops and smiling creepily at me from under a black top hat. A couple of weeks after that little incident, I noticed him again as I left my friend's apartment. He was just standing on the sidewalk with that same creepy grin plastered on his gaunt face. Since I had already informed my friend after the last incident, I simply texted him real quick to let him know the creep was back. I got into my car and left after sending the text, so I didn't find out until later that the creepy co-worker was gone by the time my friend got downstairs to the sidewalk. At that point, though, the texts were still coming even faster than before. He was even threatening to come by my house if I didn't respond. Long, provocative text dictating what he'd like to have happen between us if he did just happen to show up at my house. When I would see him during the day at work, though, he would act as though everything were normal, giving no hint of his nighttime persona. After seeing him yet again as I left my friend's apartment, I just so happened to overhear a couple co-workers of mine standing around discussing how weird our new, older co-worker was. Right then, I stepped in and joined the convo, finally showing one of my other co-workers the text messages that the creep had been sending me. I had been working with that particular co-worker for a few years, but I didn't know him too well. He was one of those people who came off kind of grumpy and distant. Still, I told him and my other co-worker not to say anything. They both nodded in agreement, and we went our separate ways to finish up for the day. When I came into work the next day, though, my boss immediately called me into his office. My boss told me that he'd been informed of the situation and the texts, and he wanted to see my phone to read them. I told my boss that I didn't really want to get anyone in trouble, but he said that was besides the point and that my situation needed to be addressed. My boss also stated that my older co-worker had no right or reason to be texting me and talking to me the way he was talking to me. The boss must have had a pretty good talk with him because all the crap stopped from the older co-worker after that. The other grumpy co-worker of mine apologized to me for saying something to the boss, but I completely understood and I was actually pretty grateful to him for that. I should have been the one to take the initiative to talk to the boss about it, but I was just too chicken. Fortunately, though, that situation seemed to work out for all involved because life went on as usual and everyone involved acted as though nothing had ever happened. Well, I can't really say that because that situation actually caused the grumpy co-worker and I to talk more and we started dating. 
We were together for about three years, and then we got married. I was in Cozumel, Mexico, driving a truck through a completely uninhabited area on my way to a beautiful secluded beach. The sun was shining, and I was eager to relax on the pristine sand, soak up some rays, and enjoy the crystal clear water. As I continued down the deserted road, I suddenly spotted something up ahead. It was unlike anything I had ever seen before. This strange creature looked like a stick figure drawing, with a disproportionately large head and a spindly body. It was all black and stood on its hind legs, seemingly aware of my presence. Without any warning, the bizarre creature darted across the road right in front of my truck. I slammed on the brakes, barely managing to avoid hitting it. My heart was pounding, and I stared in disbelief as it disappeared into the dense jungle. Shaken by the encounter, I continued on my way to the beach, but I couldn't get the image of that creepy thing out of my mind. When I met up with my friends, I told them about what I had seen and even drew a sketch of the creature. They were just as baffled as I was, unable to identify it based on my description or drawings. Over the years, I've tried to find out what that strange creature could have been. I've researched every known animal that inhabits Cozumel, but nothing seems to match the stick figure, like being I saw that day. Even my friends who still live on the island haven't been able to figure out what it was. To this day, the memory of that eerie encounter lingers in my mind. I can't help but wonder what it was that crossed my path in the uninhabited wilderness of Cozumel. Perhaps it was a creature yet to be discovered by science, or maybe it was something supernatural. Whatever it was, it remains an unsolved mystery that continues to haunt me. Two years ago, I found myself on an elk hunting trip with three of my buddies. We had set up camp near Akaya, Oregon, or at least that's what I think it was. The days were spent scouting for elk, and the evenings were filled with laughter, storytelling, and of course, drinking screwdrivers around the campfire. One particular night, as we sat around the fire, we were all in high spirits, sharing our adventures from the day. Suddenly, out of nowhere, a loud, undulating scream echoed through the forest, cutting through our laughter and chilling us to the bone. It was unlike anything any of us had ever heard before, and it sent a wave of fear through the camp. Instinctively, we all jumped up and ran for our guns, our hearts pounding in our chests. The adrenaline coursed through our veins as we frantically scanned the dark woods surrounding the camp, trying to pinpoint the source of the terrifying sound. As we stood there, weapons at the ready, we caught a glimpse of a large, shadowy figure moving swiftly through the trees. The sheer size and speed of the creature was enough to make us believe that it was a Sasquatch, a creature we had all heard stories about but never truly believed in until that moment. Just as quickly as it had appeared, the creature vanished into the darkness, leaving us all standing there, dumbfounded and shaken. We gathered around the campfire once again, our previous mirth replaced by a sense of unease. We spent the rest of the night discussing the incident, trying to rationalize what we had experienced. Over time, the memory of that night has faded, but the feeling of fear and awe that the scream evoked still lingers. We've shared our story with others some of whom believe us, while others dismiss it as a product of our overactive imaginations and too many screwdrivers. The experience I'd like to share with you happened in the summer of 2002. I was 20, still living at home in a rental, in a rental in East Mesa, Arizona, with my 18-year-old brother and my mother. As you may know, Arizona has a typically six-month-long scorching, dry summer climate. In being a transplant from beautiful northern Cali, it was hard for us to adapt. Anyhow, and it was a hot summer night in late May or early June. My brother had just graduated high school, and I was working full-time during the day. 
We spent our evening talking and laughing and playing music. It really was a memorably enjoyable night. At about 10.30, I noticed that the front porch light had again burned out, as it had been doing for about 18 months prior to that. In fact, both of the lights over the driveway and three lights in our backyard were continually ceasing to function, and it seemed I was always buying bulbs and expensive strobe light bulbs. I don't know if this is somehow connected to what happened next. First, I must add that our front door was set back into the house with the garage protruding. Our front yard was much deeper than the backyard and was overshadowed by three velvet mesquite and a china berry tree and various species of kala cacti. So the street light did little to penetrate the den of darkness. I turned the lamplight to my bedroom, which was really an office nook right next to the front door, which had a large latticed picture window with run of the mill blinds. I opened the blinds and the light flooded the wall of the garage. What I saw made my skin crawl. There on the stucco wall was something. It was only about 10 to 12 feet from where I was standing. The only way to describe it was that it looked like a giant headless moth. I called my brother over excitedly. I clearly remember our conversation. What do you suppose that is? I have no idea. It must be a bat of some sort. But we only have micro bats here in Arizona. And I've always heard that bats hang upside down. I guess it could be a giant moth. We do live in the desert. I thought moths were attracted to light. The lights are all burnt out again. We talked for a moment and stood next to the glass panes adjacent to the front door, the bedroom light illuminating all the while, and the thing did not stir or move. We decided it was about 18 inches to 2 feet long from blunt top to wing bottom. It was very clear, yet very dark, almost black, and no antennae were visible. It hung on the wall like a moth, but was about the size of a medium-sized fruit bat, which I believe only exists in Asia. It was about five or six feet off the ground. My mother came and had a look and shuddered and refused to stand near the door. We were both young and curious, and my brother said, Let's go have a look at it then. We swung the door and security screen open, and he took a step over the door jam. I was suddenly struck with an unreal, unearthly fear and grabbed his shoulder. He looked back at me and later said, I had the most wholly terrified look on my face that he had ever seen. I am afraid and tingly even writing this. Without a word, he stepped back inside, and we locked both doors and closed the blinds and camped out in the living room only going to sleep after several thoughtful conversations. The very next morning at sunrise, I went out to the wall with a tape measure, and my brother and mom stood at the door and directed me as to where and how high and how long this thing had been planted. There was no trace of anything. The dust on the stucco looked the same all around, with no residue or anything. When they were both satisfied with the positioning, I read the tape measure, 28 inches, my mother walked back into the house and has absolutely refused to speak of it since. My brother and I are both keenly interested in animal insect plant life via books and media, and I have taken in my course in Southwest Biology, and neither of us has ever seen or heard of anything matching its description. My husband was raised here and said the only thing he could think of that size was an owl, but this was no owl. What was it? Perhaps it is a real animal we could not identify. Has someone had a similar experience or know what it could be? We are not exaggerating, people. We are level-headed and analytical. Thank you for your time. I never imagined the forest I patrolled could harbor such sinister secrets. My name is Alex and I was a park ranger stationed in a remote, dense forest known as Ravenwood. For years, I had been responsible for ensuring the safety of visitors and protecting the fragile ecosystem within its boundaries. Ravenwood was vast, ancient, and filled with mysteries, but nothing could have prepared me for the chilling events that unfolded deep within its heart. It all started one crisp autumn evening as I was concluding my rounds. The sun had already dipped below the horizon, casting long shadows among the towering trees. 
I was about to head back to my ranger station when I heard it, a soft, barely perceptible whisper that seemed to come from the very trees themselves. At first, I dismissed it as a trick of the wind, a figment of my fatigued imagination, but the voice persisted, growing stronger and more insistent with every step I took towards the source. It beckoned me deeper into the woods, its eerie, melodic tone drawing me in like a siren song. I couldn't resist the allure of those whispers, and I ventured further, guided solely by their spectral voices. My flashlight cut a narrow beam through the inky darkness, revealing gnarled roots and twisted branches that seemed to reach out for me. My footsteps were muffled by the thick carpet of fallen leaves, but the whispers were always there, just ahead, just out of reach. Hours seemed to pass as I pressed on, the forest around me growing denser and more oppressive. The air grew cold, and an unnatural hush settled over the woods. It was as if nature itself held its breath, awaiting some terrible revelation. Finally, I reached a clearing deep within the forest, and there, bathed in the faint glow of the moonlight, I saw it, a colossal ancient tree, unlike any I had ever encountered. Its massive roots writhed and twisted like serpents, and its branches loomed overhead like skeletal arms. The whispers grew more intense, swirling around me in a maddening crescendo. It was then that I realized the truth. These were not ordinary voices. They were the voices of the damned, the echoes of tormented souls that had become one with the forest. As I stood there, trembling with fear, the ground beneath me trembled and the massive tree began to uproot itself, revealing a gaping black maw at its base. From that abyss emerged a nightmarish creature, an amalgamation of roots, earth, and shadow. Its hollow eyes locked onto mine, and I knew that I had uncovered a horrifying secret hidden for centuries. The creature's intentions were clear. It hungered for my soul, and it was a fate that countless others had met before me. With a surge of adrenaline, I turned and fled, the whispers of the forest now shrieking in rage as I distanced myself from the ancient malevolence. I ran faster than I ever had guided only by the light of the moon and the distant beams of my flashlight. The forest seemed to conspire against me, its roots and branches reaching out to ensnare me, but I was determined to escape the clutches of that eldritch horror. Hours later, I stumbled back into the safety of the ranger station, my heart pounding in my chest. I knew that I had uncovered a darkness that should have remained hidden, a secret that would haunt me for the rest of my days. I left Ravenwood never to return, haunted by the whispers that still echoed in my mind. The forest had revealed its malevolent secret to me, and I had narrowly escaped its grasp. But I knew that Ravenwood would always be there, waiting for the next unsuspecting soul to venture too deep into its heart, and I could only hope that they would heed the warning of the haunted whispers and turn back before it was too late. It was a day like any other in Wyoming. As a park ranger, my job was as routine as it came, patrolling, maintaining, and ensuring the safety of the park's wildlife and visitors. My name's Bernie, by the way. That evening, I decided to take a walk through a cornfield. I often went ball hunting in my free time, so naturally, I had my bow and arrows with me. The cornfield was silent except for the rustle of the corn stalks dancing in the breeze. The sun was setting, casting long, eerie shadows that blanketed the field. Suddenly, I felt an odd sensation, like I wasn't alone. It was a primal instinct, that gut feeling of being watched. As I turned around, I came face to face with a huge creature that towered over me. I gasped, my heart pounding in my chest. The creature stood upright, like a man, but covered in thick, matted hair. Its eyes were intense, almost human. I realized then that I was looking at what can only be described as Bigfoot. Fear gripped me, but instinct took over. I reached for my bow and let an arrow fly. It struck the creature square in the chest. With a monstrous roar, it fell to the ground. Slowly, I approached the fallen beast. 
my heart hammering in my chest. But as I neared, the body just vanished. One moment it was there. The next, it was as if it had never existed at all. Dumbfounded and terrified, I sprinted back home. My wife, seeing the ashen color of my face, commented that I looked as white as a cloud. I could barely stammer out what had happened. That evening changed me. Every rustle in the trees, every shadow in the field. I wondered if the creature was watching. Years ago, I experienced something that still haunts me to this day. At the time, I was dating my abusive ex, though I was still deeply in love with him. It's difficult to admit now, but back then, I couldn't see the reality of our relationship. One day, we were sitting together on a bench in Yellowstone National Park, and I found myself laying in his lap while he gently ran his hand through my hair. I remember looking up at him and noticing something strange, as if there was something else present with us. Suddenly, a piercing sound filled my ears, and for a brief moment, I saw a demonic face overlapping my exes. The demon had horns, and its flesh appeared rough, possibly burnt. Thick, gray smoke swirled around it. It was only for a moment, but I saw the demon laughing, and I got you kind of laugh. It was utterly chilling. I've never experienced anything supernatural before or since that incident and I had never even believed in demons until then. I don't discuss this encounter with many people for obvious reasons, but the memory remains vivid. One day, years after the incident, I was hiking in a national park, and I met a park ranger named Tom. After chatting for a while and feeling a sense of trust, I decided to share my eerie story with him. To my surprise, Tom told me that he had heard of similar experiences from other people who had visited the park over the years. He revealed that some people believed the park was haunted by dark energies that could manifest themselves in various ways. Tom's knowledge of these stories brought me a strange sense of comfort as it made me feel less alone in my experience. We continued to talk about the supernatural and shared other stories we had heard. By the end of our conversation, I felt a bond with Tom, and I was grateful to have met someone who could understand and validate what I had gone through. As I left the park that day, I couldn't help but wonder about the dark forces that might be lurking in the shadows, waiting to prey on unsuspecting victims. The park that I service gets little to no traffic anymore. Part of that is simply because of how small the town is. Another part of that is today's Americans just don't get out for the fresh air anymore. It's kind of sad, really. I see video games of the new fresh air of today and tablets and phones and electronics. A lot of them involve getting out into the wild and enjoying fresh air and hunting and surviving. Nobody is really into that anymore. People would rather literally pay money for a simulation. Then they could just go out themselves and do it. And yet, even as little traffic as our park gets, I still find just enough litter to make me irritated. As if people get out into nature just long enough to ruin it for everyone else. I was cleaning up some wrappers off a park bench when, among them, I noticed something different. There was one of these corn husk dolls. The kind that are fashioned after the type that Native Americans used to make. It didn't have a face, just a blank knob for a head and four nubs for arms and legs. Cute and creepy, I thought to myself, until I noticed a small piece of paper rolled up and tucked into one of its folds. I enrolled it out of curiosity, and it said, Hello there. I smirked and threw it. After I was done picking up all the trash, I went back to my patrol car. When there was another corn doll stuck behind the handle of the door, it too had another message that it read. I said, hello. I kind of prickled and looked around. As far as I could tell, I was the only person in the park, and I hadn't seen or heard anyone. But then again, I was very absorbed in my work when I was picking up trash. It's possible that somebody was watching me and playing an elaborate prank just so they could do it for, you know, giggles. Still, I didn't like to think that somebody had gotten by me like that. I quickly got inside my car, shut the door, and no sooner had I done that, I noticed a third doll sitting on my steering wheel. 
also having another note that said, Could you use a hand? I nearly sawed myself when something smacked into the windshield. It took a second to fully register, but I realized it was a severed arm in hand cut off at the elbow. Immediately, I radioed out that we had something going on in the park, and the response came fairly quick, as you would suggest and expect. But I wasn't sure if it was soon enough to keep whoever this was inside the park. I brought everybody up to speed, and there was a very thorough sweeping. They didn't find anything. No body, no killer, nothing, not even another doll. Forensics even did tests on the severed arm, and unfortunately found that it belonged to a child that had been missing for over two months. The arm that hit my windshield is relatively fresh, so that meant the kid had died recently. The rest of the day kind of went by in a haze. I felt like a failure for not catching this monster in all the moments that I could have when he was tampering with my car. Again, we never found anything and the person was never caught. It's a mystery that will always be left as just that, a mystery. As a park ranger, I'd have seen a lot of odd things in my time. We get people that come out here for all sorts of reasons, especially in the camping area when it's off-season. I've stumbled across all sorts of weird stuff, but so long as that weird stuff is legal and consensual, if you get my drift, then that's up to them. No judgment. Most of them can't even look you in the eye the next morning, and we just have a small chuckle about that. As I said, if you are consenting adults, it's your own business. But one time I came across something that ended up being a police investigation. You see, I was out and about performing one of the last evening patrols before heading home for the night. We had three tents booked in that night, and it was getting towards winter when the camping area would be closed. Two couples had appeared, and one family with a mother, dad, and two small babies. The tents were fairly spaced out, and just before midnight, everything was quiet. I just finished up heading back to the office to sign off when I saw a young girl, probably no older than 18, run past me. She was just in her underwear, and from the quick flash I saw of her face before running off to the trees, she was terrified, all wide in mouth, ready to scream. Immediately, I turned around, shining my flashlight in the direction she'd ran off to. There was nothing. I headed that way and looked all around, calling out even. Nothing. I recalled the three ladies that were booked into the campsite. They were all older. The mom was likely in her later thirties, and the two women and the couples were around their mid-twenties, I would think. There was no good reason for a young girl to be running around in the dead of night when it was freezing cold. So... I went through protocol and alerted colleagues and police. They headed out and conducted a more thorough search, woke the campers who were not happy that the babies had been disturbed, but there was no trace, literally no trace. I'm talking zero footprints where I'd seen her, no apparent way in or out that showed any evidence somebody had even ran through here, and no reports of missing teen girls or bodies showing up. I was relieved, but at the same time, not exactly sure what I saw. It did leave the question of, what the hell did I see, or did I possibly hallucinate it? I guess time will tell. So recently, May, my wife, and the rest of the family that lives with us have been hearing and or smelling strange sounds. At first, we thought it was the stray cats or raccoons. But then things started getting weirder. We started hearing sounds. Sometimes it would be footsteps. Other times we would hear knocking. We thought maybe we smoked a bit too much of the devil's lettuce. But everyone else in the house was also hearing these things. That's when the sounds started sounding like people talking to us. But the weird thing was it always sounds like they are incredibly far away. The most recent thing was the smell of a rotten corpse of some kind, but I couldn't for the life of me remember when I last smelled a corpse like that. The smell seemed almost intense, as if it were right in front of me. I checked around our home and under it to make sure there were no dead animals. This happened at almost twelve at night, when my wife and I were outside smoking. I had my brother come out and check, and even he agreed that it wasn't just me who smelled it. He said it smells like a corpse of person. 
That's when I remembered why the smell seemed so familiar, because a man had died a few years ago. And I remember how many times we walked by his corpse. They realized he died inside the wall, but I never forgot the smell. It was a very horrid smell. Still, that smell only has happened once, and it hasn't come back that I know of. I'm usually one to think of scientific reasons. I ended up checking if any possible sewage had leaked from a pipe or if it came from our neighbor's home, but nothing seemed out of the ordinary. These weird happenings only seem to happen at night, and most of the people who live near us are usually asleep by 10 p.m., and we stay up till about 12 or 1 in the morning. My neighbors have told me that on the few occasions they have been outside at that hour, they say they feel uncomfortable or they hear something but they chalk up to maybe the random animals or them being tired. I'll post an update if anything significant happens. I would also like any opinions or theories to know what it might be. My name is Alex, and I'm an experienced park ranger with years of service under my belt. I never could have imagined the terrifying ordeal that awaited me when I agreed to lead a team of scientists and archaeologists on an expedition to study an ancient Native American settlement in a remote, uncharted area of the National Park. As we delved deeper into the ruins, the atmosphere grew heavy with a palpable sense of history. The settlement was remarkably well preserved a testament to the ingenuity of the people who had once called it home. But as we continued our exploration, we stumbled upon a horrifying scene. The bodies of over 50 people all brutally slaughtered. It soon became apparent that the settlement had been ravaged by a long, dormant supernatural creature, a wendigo that killed people on sight. The mere mention of its name sent shivers down our spines, and we knew that we had to find a way to stop the creature before it could wreak further havoc. As we searched for answers, we found a series of runes etched into the walls of a hidden cave. The symbols told the story of the Wendigo, its origins, and most importantly, the method to banish it from this world. With no time to lose, we worked together to decipher the runes and perform the ritual needed to rid the world of the Wendigo. The air crackled with energy as we recited the ancient incantation, and the Wendigo let out a blood-curdling scream that echoed throughout the settlement. As the creature writhed in agony, it finally vanished, banished from this realm by the power of the ancient magic. But as we stood at among the ruins, our relief was tempered by the knowledge that we were too late to save the lives of those who had fallen victim to the Wendigo's wrath. The settlement, once a thriving community, now stood as a haunting testament to the dark forces that had brought about its demise. As we returned to the park, the weight of our discovery weighed heavily upon us. The ancient settlement and the tragic fate of its inhabitants would remain a somber reminder of the mysteries that lay hidden within the depths of the National Park and the darkness that sometimes lurked just beneath the surface of our world. It happened five years ago. The official ruling was that his death was caused by a rogue bear attack. You know, when a bear gets a little too used to eating human food so it doesn't feel threatened anymore, and attacks a human. They all know it wasn't a bear, though. Bears don't leave wounds like that. And they sure as hell don't pose the body 70 feet up in a dead tree. Yeah, I said pose, but before I get into the details, I should explain a bit about myself. Now, I'm a park ranger in a very popular national park in the northern United States. I don't want to say exactly which one, although I doubt I'll keep my job for much longer. Anyway, that's partially why I'm posting this. I need to tell somebody else about this story, and like I said, my colleagues don't want to talk about it. Being a park ranger has given me a lot of weird stories, and everybody is used to weird happening in the woods. But this was on a completely different level. For days, we had been getting reports from campers and hikers about strange noises coming from a section of deep backcountry forests. Growls, yipping, even human. Sounding voices. Equipment and food had been going missing from backcountry campgrounds. 
all pretty typical stuff that can be explained away pretty easily. Many animals thieve food, make weird noises, and even the human voices can be explained by the sound that foxes and mountain lions make at night. But we needed to investigate either way because an animal that is conditioned to human food is dangerous. So we sent our veteran backcountry ranger, Craig McKay, this guy had been working there for 30 years, was an expert outdoorsman and was my mentor when I first started. As always, he jumped into the task, always eager to go into the backcountry, even though he was getting a little older. I'll pause now and let Craig tell the rest of the story. Well, his journal will have to tell the rest of the story because he isn't alive to tell it. I found his journal, a flashlight in his backpack inside a small cave near the location of his body. A couple of days after he didn't return, and we had sent out a search party to find him. I haven't shared this journal with anyone not even the other rangers until now. I'm not exactly sure why I've kept it hidden. Other than that, the truth seems so messed up and unreal. I didn't want it to damage people's memory of Craig. I'm not even sure if I believe it myself. Everything I'm going to read to you, he had written down over the two days he was out on his backcountry excursion. October 21st, 2011, Day 1. Today was a long day. And I can't say that I've made much progress. I've hiked about 15 miles over the course of the day, starting down in the gully, where the reports first started and ending up at my current camp, which is on the southwest side of Bald Knob. I figure it's a good enough place to keep an eye out for anything coming and going through the valley. Earlier, I found some tracks in the ground in the area, and as close as I can tell, they're from a mountain goat. Odd that it would travel alone but maybe it was separated from its herd or dying. It had an odd gait. I followed them for a while, but they didn't lead anywhere, so I abandoned them. Near the tracks was a pervasive smell of death, and I'm assuming a goat got separated and died. Tomorrow I'm planning to hike across the valley to the mountain on the opposite side and see if I can't catch a track of whatever is harassing the campers. October 22nd, 2011 morning of day two. Quick note while I eat breakfast. Last night was a long night, one of the longest I've had in a while. About an hour after going to bed, I heard light steps near the campsite. I grabbed the rifle and went out to investigate. No lights so my eyes could stay adjusted to the dark. The second I stepped out of my tent, the noise stopped. Whatever was there knew that I was watching. I made a couple of circles around the campsite and found nothing, but I could feel something watching me from the shadows. As I got back into my tent, I thought I saw a tall silhouette in the clearing, but I must have just been seeing things. It was too skinny to be a bear, and nothing else is that tall. The strong scent of death was still present and kept me wary all night. Today's mission has changed. I just got a radio call that a couple of hikers haven't returned when they were supposed to last night and might be lost. I'm still crossing the valley today, but this time to reach where the hikers were supposed to be. Last October 22nd, 2011, night of day two. Stop for the night in the valley, cooking dinner now. Chicken and rice again. Dead tired and I'm getting too old for this. No progress on the hikers, and still smells like death, though much stronger than before. I've just heard some sounds that sound like they could be voices. I can't get the radio to work in this valley. Looks like I'm not getting dinner tonight after all. Going to take a light pack and see if I can follow these voices. October 22nd, 2011, night of day two. Second entry scribbled. Dear God, what did I find? barely made it to this cave. I can hear it scratching and gurgling outside, going to try and block the entrance and see if I could stay here overnight. I found out where the smell of death came from. Got the cave entrance cracked, covered with a large rock and some brush. It will have to do. The beast is still outside, clawing at the crack in the rock. Don't think I'll sleep tonight anyway. Not after what I saw. I might as well record this because these might be my last words. For the first time in my career, I'm scared. I don't even know what I saw. It was huge, about seven and a half feet tall and possibly fast. Smells like putrid meat. 
Earlier, when I left camp, the voices outside became more and more persistent. They were definitely human voices. I followed them until I reached the clearing, and suddenly everything went silent. No voices, no hikers. It sounded like the forest itself was holding its breath. I heard a slight sound behind me before I was thrown off my feet, knocked the wind out of me. My rifle was ripped from my hand before I could even use it. I was picked up by my leg and thrown across the clearing. I could feel its claws digging like knives into my muscle. The thing dragged me up right against the tree, and I could feel its breath on my neck, breathing out a putrid smell. I could feel the blood pouring from my leg and soaking into my pants. The agonizing pain from the wound left me trembling. I could feel the weight of its body as it pushed up against me, ready to go in for the kill. I heard the smack of its mouth opening and prepared myself to die when a crash in the distance distracted the beast, long enough for me to make a break for it. I ran for my life, and I didn't look back, but knew it wasn't far behind me. About twenty feet away was the entry to this cave that I was able to squeeze into. It's still outside. I could hear it shuffling around, trying to get into the crack, and I could hear the heavy breathing, the sucking gasping sound coming from its mouth. I have no idea what I'm going to do. Dear God, please help me out of this. I want to see my wife again. I want to see my kids again. My nose is filled with the putrid smell of impending death. If I make it through the night, my plan is to wait until first light and try to escape back to the ranger station. Those are the last words we have by Craig McKay. When he never reported back, we assumed his radio had gone out of range. But after a couple of days, we sent a search party to find him. Well, we found him all right, from the tracks. It looks like Craig left the cave early the next day. He makes it about fifty feet from the cave entrance when a second set of tracks catches up to him. Goat tracks more specifically, a goat with only two legs. The gate matches something that would be a bit more than seven feet, like Craig described in his journal. What we found of Craig was dragged seventy feet up a nearby tree and torn to pieces. He was hardly recognizable. His torso was jammed onto a short branch on the tree that kept him hanging there, his arms splayed out to his sides. His innards were strewn around the base of the tree. The jagged shadow remains of his leg bones stuck out of the early snowfall that had come to the mountains this year. Nothing appeared eaten or missing, but not a single piece of him was left untouched by the monster. It took the rest of the day in a special rope team to get him down. The missing hikers were never found. Those scraps of clothing matching what they were wearing have been found in the same valley where Craig died. Like I said earlier, the official story is a bear attack. Bears don't do this. We don't know what did this. We've rerouted trails to stay away from this area, but we still hear reports of human sending voices coming from the woods. And we've had some more hikers than normal go missing in the last five years. They are found, but it's always too late. Some are arranged like Craig was, broken warnings to other hikers who dare intrude upon the beast's forest. Some are just never seen again. My name is John, a seasoned park ranger assigned to mentor a rookie named Ethan. On his first assignment, we ventured deep into the remote backcountry of the vast national park, eager to pass on my knowledge and experience. Little did I know, our routine patrol would quickly become a harrowing fight for survival. We stumbled upon a series of gruesome animal killings that defied any logical explanation. The carcasses were left in a manner that suggested no known predator was responsible. As we investigated further, we discovered the existence of a pack of supernatural predators that could blend into the shadows, moving silently and unseen. These creatures were unlike anything we'd ever encountered, and their mere presence sent a chill down our spines. Ethan and I knew we had to overcome our fears and rely on our skills to outwit these elusive predators. Our priority was to alert the public to the danger lurking within the park's borders, but we knew we needed to act fast. We devised a plan to lure the creatures into a trap, using our knowledge of the terrain and animal behavior to our advantage. 
Unfortunately, our plan did not go as smoothly as we had hoped. As we managed to ensnare the predators in our carefully laid traps, Ethan became separated from me. I heard him cry out, and my heart sank as I realized that my young protege had fallen victim to the creatures we were trying to stop. Despite the pain and guilt that weighed heavily upon me, I pressed on capturing the remaining predators. As I stood there mourning the loss of Ethan, a government helicopter suddenly arrived. Before I could react, a group of armed agents emerged and locked me in, taking the captured predators with them. I demanded answers, but my pleas fell on deaf ears. The helicopter took off, leaving me with a sinking feeling that I would never learn the truth about the creatures or the government's involvement. After that day, no one ever saw or heard from me again. My disappearance became one of the many mysteries that haunted the park a chilling reminder of the unknown dangers lurking in the shadows. I remember back in high school, my religion teacher shared some jaw, dropping stories with us. He claimed to have worked as an assistant to the local exorcist involved in intense spiritual battles against the forces of darkness. It was an unexpected twist in our religious education but it certainly grabbed our attention. He recounted encounters where he had direct conversations with the devil himself. These exchanges were chilling and unsettling, as he described the cunning and manipulative nature of the fallen angel. The things he heard during those interactions would send shivers down our spines, but it did stop there. My teacher went on to describe the physical manifestations that accompanied these exorcisms, he spoke of furniture being violently thrown across the room as if an invisible force was wreaking havoc. The intensity of these encounters was like something out of a horror movie. What intrigued us even more was the revelation that most of the people who required exorcism were practitioners of Satanism. It seemed that their involvement in dark rituals and worshipping the devil had invited malevolent entities into their lives. As unsettling as it was to hear, it reinforced the importance of spiritual discernment and the need for protection against evil influences. Those stories stayed with me long after high school. They challenged my beliefs and made me question the existence of supernatural forces. While I couldn't fully comprehend or verify the authenticity of my teacher's experiences, they served as a reminder of the constant struggle between good and evil that transcends the boundaries of our physical world. Whether or not one believes in the paranormal, these stories opened up discussions and expanded our understanding of faith, spirituality, and the power of belief. It was a unique and unforgettable chapter in my high school experience where the lines between reality and the supernatural blurred, leaving us with more questions than answers. This happened nine years ago in the early spring when I was 15 years old, spring 2014. I was at a friend's house in corn country about an hour north of Indianapolis. Nowadays, I am very familiar with the paranormal unexplained, having multiple shared experiences with friends, but at the time I was a major skeptic. I didn't fully process what we saw until years later. I came over to my friend's house to hang out like any other time. I brought my pellet gun, he had one as well, so we could shoot some moles on his farm property. After a while, his brother joined us, and we eventually got bored of looking for moles. There was a patch of woods about the size of two football fields, a little over a mile away, completely surrounded by empty cornfields with no access points from the nearby road. The three of us decided to walk out there, because why not? We were bored kids looking for fun. We put on some boots and headed out with our pellet guns. The walk wasn't super far, but it took us a while to reach the woods because all the spring rain from earlier in the week made the empty field a big mud pit. So muddy, your foot disappears with each step. Then right as we walked through the brush surrounding the edge of the woods, we saw it. The best way I can describe this thing is it was a raccoon that was built like a Great Dane. We had seen coyotes and wolves before, and this was not that. 
It 100% looked like the biggest raccoon we had ever seen. We could tell we caught it off guard because it was just standing there on all fours grooming itself. And then it immediately locked eyes with us when one of us pointed at it and said, Look at that thing. There were a couple of seconds where we just looked at it as it looked back at us before it quickly turned around and scaled a 60-feet tree. We lost sight of it in the canopy. We then looked at each other and were like, WTF was that? We talked about how the way it climbed the tree was what freaked us out the most. It only took a few strides up the tree, using its front two paws to grab a spot on the tree to lift and launch itself up the tree. The arms were freakishly long and lanky looking when it climbed. It honestly looked somewhat human in the way it articulated its arms as it climbed, like its elbows jutted out to the sides as it pulled itself up. We talked about how freaky that was some more and decided to keep looking around because even though we were spooked, it was intriguing and we wanted to see if there was any other freaky stuff around. There definitely was. The woods were littered with easily over 100 animal carcasses, bone piles. Most of them were cows, raccoons, and opossums. There was one spot, maybe 25 by 25 feet, that had at least a dozen cow carcasses ranging from just the bone left to one that looked less than a week old. They were definitely being eaten by something with huge chunks of flesh missing. I know cows get loose all the time, but damn if this didn't look like a feeding spot. My theory is this thing was stealing cows from local farms for food. There are a couple within five miles. We also found a man made small pond near the middle of the woods, which couldn't have been more than six feet wide. A shovel and plastic bucket was sitting next to it. Once we found that, we're pretty freaked out again and decided we'd better head back because we had less than two hours of daylight left and there was a lot of thick, deep mud to slowly walk through to get back. That's pretty much it. At the time, it freaked me out a bit, but looking back now, knowing what skinwalkers are, I'm just happy we came back completely unscathed. Unfortunately, I don't hang out with those guys anymore, and I tried to go back with some different friends, somewhat recently only to see that the woods had been cleared out, and there was nothing there. I thought I was tripping out, but I looked on Google Earth, and I could see in its place was dirt and log piles. Probably an omen to not chase this thing. I'll take it at face value. I haven't heard of the dogman, but this thing didn't look like a dog coyote at all. I just used Great Dane as a size comparison as it was freakishly large to be looking like a raccoon. Yes, it had a striped tail like a raccoon. It had the face of a raccoon, specifically the large black spots around its eyes. Stubby, almost rounded ears like a raccoon. It had bushy fur like a raccoon. We saw it very clearly with no obstructions from about 30, 40 feet away. It was early spring and the brush inside the canopy was still dead. I used to hunt in Leon County at my family's old homestead that has been around since the late 1800s. The uh, frame house that my grandmother was born in is still standing. It was built in 1920, I believe, and I would drive in from College Waco and spend the night while hunting down there. We were always scared to be alone in that house just because of all the old furniture and pictures, etc. I fell asleep on the couch one night when a norther was blowing through. I remember awaking briefly, thinking it had gotten cold, but fell right back to sleep. In the morning when I woke up, I had an old quilt draped over me. This was not a quilt that would have just been draped over the couch. In fact, my mother confirmed later that she had that quilt put up in a closet. It sounds crazy, but I have no other explanation. I had no recollection of ever getting up. I'm a believer in guardian angles, and that is all I can sum this experience up to. Needless to say, it was several years before I stomached up the nerve to sleep alone in that house again. My mom, dad, and cousin each have a story that takes place on the same patch of road in Mexico. 
I'll tell them as they were relayed to me individually. My parents actually met here in the United States, but they grew up in neighboring pueblos in Mexico. Connecting the two pueblos is a long, empty span of road, maybe five miles, long, which is apparently haunted. These stories take place many years apart, but on the exact same patch of road. When my dad was a young man, he loved horses, jerry poes, and drinking. While he has since put down the bottle, he still loves horses and jerry poes, lol, but back in the day, he would occasionally ride his horse out across the road to the neighboring Pueblo to hang out or hit up some parties. One early morning, he was returning home on horseback from a party in the neighboring Pueblo. He was a bit drunk and was just casually making his way home when suddenly the air grew still and the night went silent. He said something just felt off and his horse could sense it as well. My dad says that you can always tell what a horse is focusing on by looking at their ears and in this case my dad's horse's ears were perked up stiff and focusing at the empty field beside them as well as all around them. Thinking that there might be some sort of animal stalking them my dad looked around, but the fields beside them were empty and there weren't any bushes or things for an animal to hide behind. Suddenly the air went cold and my dad felt goosebumps on the back of his neck, almost as if something was right behind him. That's when my dad's horse couldn't take it anymore and took off running for its life. My dad held on tightly and tried several times to bring the horse to a stop, but it was dead set on getting the hell away from whatever they had just encountered. Eventually, they finally reached their Pueblo, and the horse calmed down and came to stop. Never before or after had the horse behaved that way, and it left my dad shook up. Needless to say, he was sober by the time he reached home. Me, my uncle, and my cousins went to this site to hunt deer. We lined up six abreast on the far side of the trench to push any deer out. As we walked along, I inadvertently got forced down into the trench. I then kept with the direction of the trench. After a short time, I smelled something. It smelled like some stinking animal. Then I heard it running back and forth as if frantically looking for something. I could tell by the sound it was two-legged. I could feel the ground shake like when a herd of elk gets spooked. At this point, I hear a tree maybe six to ten inches on the stump come crashing to the ground behind me. At this point, I made extreme haste for the walls of the trench. Pulling on vines, I made my way out and straight for our vehicles. I did not linger at the trench for further investigation. From all of my experience in the woods, I can, with full confidence, say what I encountered was not a bear and was definitely two-legged. Hiking with a companion and two German shepherds around 9 a.m. in the Rogumpqua wilderness, saw a large brown object moving fast through the understory, which was quite thick. Dogs chased the object. Both dogs had saddle packs. One dog had a tarp, which was securely rolled and tied on the middle of his back. Dogs were gone about three, five minutes and came running back. One dog, which had the tarp on return and continued to run past us and ended up at the shelter, about one mile back where we had stayed the night and was extremely scared. The other older dog stopped when encountering us and listened when we told it to stop, but was also very scared. Several things were unusual, the intense musty smell, something like a bull, elk, and heat, but not or not like a bear either. The dogs fear as they have chased bears, coyotes, deer, elk, and are never scared upon return. The tallness of the object as it was way too tall for a bear or elk. Too quiet for an elk also. The untied tarp which was securely tied, but upon return of the chase, the tarp was tied but just one knot. I tie good knots. As Lorna Park Ranger of the Green Lakes National Park, my days were usually filled with the routine tasks of patrolling and maintaining the park. But that particular evening was different. 
I had been off duty, indulging in a spot of elk hunting near the old growth, an area dense with towering trees that had seen centuries pass by. The sun was gently sinking, painting the sky in hues of orange and purple. It was my favorite time of the day in the park, a time when the hustle of the day eased and the nocturnal orchestra started tuning up. The first scream pierced the peaceful dusk like a shard of glass. It was long, chilling, and unlike anything I'd ever heard in the park. My heart pounded in my chest as I tried to decipher the source. It sounded distant, past a clear cut some two hundred yards away. I gripped my hunting rifle tighter, my senses on high alert. The second scream came, then the third, each roughly five to six seconds long and spaced out over a span of ten minutes. The sounds were loud, almost deafening, echoing through the otherwise quiet forest. It felt as if the forest held its breath, the usual chirping of birds and rustling of leaves replaced by an eerie silence. What intrigued me was not just the volume or the frequency of the screams, but the pattern. It was as if whatever was making the sound was trying to communicate. The screams had a certain rhythm to them, an odd cadence that sounded like a kitty. As a park ranger, I was familiar with the cries and calls of the park's wildlife, but this was something new, something foreign. Every instinct told me to retreat to get to the safety of the ranger station, but my curiosity pushed me forward. I moved stealthily, my boots crunching softly against the forest floor. The screams had stopped, replaced by an unsettling silence. I felt the hair on the back of my neck stand up, a primal part of me acknowledging the unknown. As I neared the source of the sound, I took a deep breath, preparing myself for whatever was out there. The twilight had given way to the moon's pale glow, casting long, ominous shadows between the trees. I squinted, trying to make out any movement, but the forest stood still, as if it were holding its breath. Then, just as I was about to turn back, I saw it. In the clearing, bathed in the moonlight, was a creature. It was unlike anything I had seen before, a being straight out of a folk tale. As our eyes met, it let out a scream, the same chilling, ah, kitty, that had led me here. I held my breath, my grip on the rifle tightening. That night I came face to face with the unknown, and it changed my perspective forever. The park was not just a job anymore. It was a land of mysteries waiting to be discovered, and I was its custodian. Last year I was with a buddy of mine, and we were going to do the Hart Creek Scramble in Alberta, but due to some health conditions he has, it was going too strenuous to complete, and we figured we'd make it an easy day and just do the simple trail. Now we're both climbers and have been to Hart Creek for rock climbing in the past and had a great time, so it wasn't a surprise to see the sporadic climbers on the mountainside as we went. Hart Creek is also pretty popular and easy for people who just want to go for a nice nature walk and maybe have picnic. Anyway, so we walked in, enjoying the day, watching climbers on our way by. We saw a couple even doing some multi-pitch climbing, which means basically leap frogging up the route. We settled in for lunch about a half hour later and left a couple hours after that. On our way back, I remember seeing a climbing shoe in the creek and thinking, oh, someone must have lost this. I picked it up when my buddy got my attention and I looked further downstream. Both climbers, a young man, 29 or so, I learned later, and his partner were both lying the creek bed, rope and harnesses still attached, dead. It was very surreal. We had seen these people climbing not two hours before, making their calls, having a good time. The first reaction I had was that I remembered that there was a family right behind us, a husband and wife with a young daughter who were playing in the creek on the way down. We ran back and stopped them and explained as quietly as we could what was ahead, and before we knew it, looky, Luz had come back. It turned out that the husband was an off-duty RCMP officer, and so he took control of the situation. I learned later we weren't the first on scene, and that the authorities had been called. It was a very quiet ride back into town that day, though. Edit. I have more details if people are interested. Real edit.
Holy crap, sorry, y'all. Okay, more details, so the couple who were climbing were both experienced enough, but one was still learning they attempted to do a dual lowering maneuver, using each other's weight and feeding the rope through their belays. One of them made a mistake and lost their end of the rope, and that was it for both of them. There wasn't a lot of blood, strangely, and they looked very peaceful. I didn't get a good look at the girl. I mostly only saw the guy there. The story ran for a couple of days in the area, talking about the male as the family of the girl didn't want to disclose anything. That was not something I thought I'd see that day, that's for sure. I'm going to peruse the comments for any specific questions. This is a story my uncle told us when he was younger, and my cousin was just some months old. I was around 15 or so. He was explaining it to my father and looked actually scared about it. For what he told my father and I heard there myself, he had been dreaming three, four times with the same old woman and his daughter. The woman had bright red eyes, and in all his dreams he heard his baby one way or another. So just a nightmare which sucked, but whatever. Some days later, they go around town with their baby and took some photos. And when a couple of weeks later, my uncle went to get them developed, he got a nasty surprise. In one of the photos of just the baby playing on some grass, there was an old woman at the background. The light had made it so she had red eyes, and my uncle sworn up and down it was the same woman that appeared in his dreams. And then his wife pipped in that indeed there was something strange there because she could have sworn they were alone in the park while taking those photos. She didn't seem to believe it was that scary, but she hadn't noticed the woman at all, she said. They spent a week or so staying with us until my uncle decided it was his imagination, and they went back home. Two years later, his wife tried to kill him while he was sleeping with a knife and tried to go after their daughter, but that didn't have anything to do with it. Turns out having schizophrenia, not saying anything to your boyfriend, even when he turns into your husband, stopping taking your meds and your whole family deciding to lie to that same husband, saying you were perfectly fine is not a good idea. Lived alone in a sub-basement, flat once. A lot of weird things happened that I put down to the fact I was constantly tired from working split shifts six days a week. Honestly, if it was something else, it was actually super helpful. I'd come home knowing I really needed to put a clothes wash on, and when I got in, I'd find my clothes were clean. That kind of thing, but it was happening a lot. I really thought that my schedule was so messed up that I was doing things and not remembering doing them, so I was more concerned that I was losing my mind than being haunted. Anyway, the thing I really can't explain away is the time I was lying on my couch and I noticed something catching the light on a glass panel on the door. Got up to look at it and saw it was a kiss mark. But basically, from that moment on, I was finding them all over the place, on mirrors, on the other doors, even on the stovetop, basically any shiny surface. I may have been washing clothes without remembering, but I definitely wasn't going around kissing things in my flat. Oh, and also, I would often find my front door wide open, despite being sure that I'd locked it or at least shut it, which made me think that maybe a living human was getting into my place and doing weird shit. Thanks for listening. Hope to see you tomorrow, son.